Welcome back to the Impact Lounge. You are in the number one place to be for the Impact Wrestling fan. This is the Cool Factor Podcast. I'm your host, TW. And of course, with me is the man with the plan, BQ. Say what's up to the people. What up, party people? Hope you guys dig my new... Hope you guys dig my new Lady Frost Ice Cold Killer shirt. Just came in the mail. I posted on Twitter my recent Shop Impact delivery so i had i got this i got the alicia edwards shirt of course and then the uh steve macklin one too so very nice had to had to freshen up my my impact attire very nice very nice i I like the shirt man i like the shirt man lady frost she definitely seems like one to watch i got a a a glimpse of her match on bti and i thought it was quite thorough quite thorough she did a good job and and uh but i'm sure we'll talk about that going forward um real quick she missed missed the finish oh yeah yeah everyone's allowed to miss every once in a while it's all good yeah 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 i I do have an interesting thing about that that makes me i I do wonder though for a wrestler right like if you if you're doing a moonsault in reality you don't want to hit a moonsault flush you don't because you don't want your body landing flush on someone else's body like in real life that hurts right like your ribs landing on someone else's ribs like you knock the wind out of yourself you knock the wind out of that person possibly break some vital things like (laughs) you don't really want to land a moonsault flush but i'm just curious as to what's ideal in terms of landing a moonsault i know that's probably a little too much behind the curtain you know inside baseball but i'm just curious because i think like a lot of us we watch these things and we're like, oh, they missed it, but I get it. You know what I mean? We just kind of go along with it. But um, yeah. but again, like I also understand that like, you know, like I said, I think that ideally you don't want to land a moonsault flush. You know, like I, I just, I, it doesn't sound like it's good for anybody involved. Yeah. You know, so yeah, I, 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 but I, I'd be curious to know from somebody who does these type of things, like what's an ideal landing for a moonsault or even like, um, like a, you see so many people doing frog splashes, right? And when they do the frog splash, like they knock the wind out of themselves. They're like, oh, you know, I hurt myself because that that makes logical sense, right? If you're jumping onto something or someone, you're going to hurt yourself as well. Um, so yeah, I'd be curious to some, from someone who who actually has trained as a wrestler or, uh, or, or, you know, is an active wrestler, like what is the ideal landing for a moonsault? Um, if, if, if anybody out there has a connection like that, go ahead and drop that in the comments. Educate us, enlighten us, let me know. <laughs> um, so before we go any further in this video, stop what you're doing and hit that like button right now. Hit it, hit it, hit it, hit it. Okay, cool. All right, hit the like button so everybody knows how much you like this video. If it's your first time here, or maybe if it's multiple visits here, hit that subscribe button so that everybody, oh, excuse me, so that you are subscribed to this channel and hit the notification bell so that you get notified each and every time we drop some brand new fire content on this page. So without any further ado, (laughs) BQ, what's been kind of, you know, piquing your interest outside of the Impact Zone? We're going to get into this episode of Impact, everybody. Hold your horses. I know y'all are here to to hear us talk about this week's episode of Impact, which was pretty fire. Um, but before we, let's just, you know, let's see if there's anything else going on around the world of Impact, all right? So, BQ, what's been piquing your interest other than this this week's episode of Impact? I wish I had this great, amazing, phenomenal answer for you, but there, the Impact news front was a little dry this week. Um, there's a couple things that came out, you know, Larry D said when he, you know, he asked for his release because he wasn't doing shit. You know, that was something we we knew watching. Um, there, there wasn't a lot, man. Uh, you know, people have been passing around photos of the, the seating charts and everything. That's a very hot thing amongst the Impact fans that they like to do. But there wasn't a lot. Viewership went up about 3,000 people. So, you know, maybe this is the ballpark it's going to be in. We saw the big bump a couple weeks ago. You know, maybe it you know, doesn't appear that it's sustainable. But they just got to keep putting on good shows because these shows are good. They yes. uh, they really haven't had a bad one since the pay per view. Mm-hmm. It's it's just they they've been just doing a, a really good job. So 
there's a couple other things I'll want to talk about once we, um, they're going to tie into the episode though. Uh, what I will say is, so I've been posting on Twitter lately, getting some people involved and, um, you know, I, I posted out, I, I, I didn't post, but I mentioned on the last week's podcast and, and people found a lot of interest in this that I was pointing out with the video editing, uh, the, the, the color correction. You know, and, and I even put out a couple Twitter videos that I did screen recordings on my phone. And I said, this is what they're doing. And I, right in front of your face, I took my saturation. It wasn't saturation, but it's the um, contrast tab. Right, pulled right. it all the way to the right one way and showed people this is what impact looks like. This is how the show is being edited. And I showed, uh, I've shared a couple photos and stuff, but I show people, hey, this is this is why... Uh, if a wrestler's wearing black or something like that, it completely fades into the background. Um, you know, it, and then today I posted something where I was like, this is why their skin is orange sometimes on screen. And I, I said, you know, I, I dragged that con- that contrast again. Uh, I took my saturation tab, pulled that a little bit too. And I said, this is what we see on impact. You know, like I show people right there. Uh, and then I noticed watching this episode, it's actually the hard camera that they do it on. If you notice the other shots when they're outside the ring from the side, it's it looks normal. It's the hard camera one that, for whatever reason, they not for whatever reason they're like, hey, we want this to be the the angle that pops, but it's too much. They're not like less is more when you're doing color correction. You just want to do a little little tiny bit to sharpen it up, make some colors pop, and that's why I've actually been so disgusted all this time with the red. And and I realized when I was messing with the tab. It's because the, the the shade of red is getting really ugly when I do it. Uh, mm-hmm. So the other thing I was pointing out too, and you can hear it on this episode. This episode sounded like shit, by the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, this this setting this set of tapings has not sounded good. And what it is is impact is being is no. So we talked about this before too, that they were mixing the the video down to a very low quality. Uh, mm-hmm. audio wise they're actually di- mixing it down to a mono channel and not to insult anyone's intelligence but if you don't understand mono when something is in stereo say you've got headphones on and you're listening to music something is in stereo with, whether you're listening to hip hop or whatever brand or I mean, whatever genre i mean stereo means you might hear some snares hit here some cymbals here some background vocals on this it's a it's a wide vocal that's stereo when it's in you know the left and right have two different things going on when it's mono everything is in one single channel and everything is mushed together and they're all sharing that same space and when that happens the crowd vo- the crowd volume is going to get down very very low everything's going to sound really really phasey um and I, it's kind of hard for me to explain what phasey means but this is what's going on, you know, just been looking into this, got people messaging me, we're doing research as a whole, and uh, it, it 100% is down to a mono channel. Now, BTI is not color corrected, and they mix it down in stereo, I guess, because that's what they do for YouTube. So BTI, <coughs> excuse me, looks and sounds better. And I've been saying... It would shock me if the same person edited both shows. I've been saying this for a little while now. And now I I really feel that that's the case. It's completely different. And it just sounds better. So this is what we're noticing, you know, now with Impact. Is that, yeah, it is being mixed down to a very, very low quality audio and video. And that's why when we're watching it, it just, you know, just doesn't sound good. Right. Yeah, yeah, that and the, um, you know, again, like my biggest pet peeve is not being able to hear the fans. You know, I think that it's very important. I say it all the time, you know, like um, Impact's number one problem, no matter what you think Impact's number one problem is, their number one problem is their perception. And they need to fight the perception that that people don't go to their shows, that people don't have fun at their shows, that it's not a fun, interesting product. And I think not being able to hear the fans is just a huge I think it would help so much, you know, again, anybody who watched, uh, you know, the previous era of NXT knows that 
the thing that stood out the most about that product was that the audience was a part of the show. And, you know, with, with all the chanting and, and, and singing and, and all of that stuff, you know, they, I, I think in a lot of ways that NXT audience from the Full Sail Arena, you know, they changed the way that people um, watch wrestling um, because people just, they, they just want to be a part of that fun in that building. And so when that, when NXT would go places around the country, you'd get tens of thousands of people reacting that same way. And I think that impact, they need people to people at home to hear the audience so that people at home watch this and go, Oh, that sounds like fun. I want to be in there. You know what I mean? Like I, I want to be in there. And so, uh, so yeah, man. So, so ultimately it, it, that's probably an audio issue to issue too. Um, because again, like, I think, I, I think about this, I'm like, yo, how can they encourage people to be louder at their shows? Maybe people are loud at the shows. You know, maybe we are loud at a lot of the shows. We just can't hear them because, you know, I don't know if they put mics in the crowd, you know, uh, I mean, like in like WWE and AEW, maybe they put mics in the crowd, you know, um, I don't know what they do, but the crowd noise is a huge part of the show. It makes it feel more lively, right? And I think that's something that Impact really needs. And whenever they have like, a live event you can hear the crowd more and it makes the show feel more alive yeah and i remember going to my first impact show in orlando when it was on pop tv and i remember thinking dude it's loud as shit in here like it, it was very effing loud and i'm sure I'm, I'm sure i've said this dozens of times over the years but i walked into the episode i was a little late but i walked into the segment with lashley and the pope in the ring where the Pope was protecting Matt, Josh Matthews because Lashley was kind of bullying him. That led to a match where Pope actually wrestled uh, Lashley and got his ass kicked in about two minutes. But I remember walking, I walked in during that and the place was, was going crazy. Right. And then I watched the episode on TV the next week and it just, I mean, you would have never known. You, you would have had no clue. So, you know, right. Exactly. But, but that is a big deal. Been, uh -huh. I've been I've been I've been actually chatting with uh you know a, a friend of the show um uh Twitter name uh the franchise um it, he's a he's a he's a fan of the show and he actually has been going to a lot of the impact shows and I was asking him you know I was asking him just you know if the the way it sounds on TV is representative of the way it sounds in person and he said absolutely not and he posts videos so if you guys just go to Twitter and search the franchise and you'll see this guy's Twitter account and he posts a lot of videos from being in the audience and you can hear the crowd when, you know, like things are going on, like when the music's playing and, uh, and, 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 and people are like doing their entrance and all that stuff. And you can hear people chanting and clapping and all that stuff. It just doesn't come across on TV. And so like, um, if there weren't wrestling programs to compare this to, to know that this is a fixable thing, then we would, you know, I don't know, maybe we wouldn't think right. there was anything wrong with it. But because we can see other wrestling programs do this better, right? We can see that they do this uh, and, and, and allow us to hear the fans and it makes the show feel like more fun, then we, it's a glaring miss on Impact's part. And that's something they need to put very high on their list of priorities of getting fixed. Because again, it's monkey see, monkey do, for lack of a better word. If, if, if people see something on TV they feel like looks like fun, they're going to want to go there and have that fun. Yeah, and so he, an example, a comparison, is I, I order NBA League Pass. Say your, your team is playing or, or you just want to watch a game. For whatever reason, the audio quality of that game is so effing low. So I'm, the other night I'm watching the Clippers versus the Mavericks. And you couldn't hear the, the game was in Dallas. You couldn't hear the crowd for shit. And then we watched the, the halftime show because because it's league pass and it's not TNT or something. You no, know, they'll actually show the halftime show. Right. This dude's beatboxing, just killing it. And mm -hmm. you know, at the end he's done and it just sounds like it's crickets, you know, like you just couldn't hear people. And then right. you could hear the PA announcer at times saying, you know, this and this and this, and it's just this low volume. But the announcers you could hear perfectly fine. I was like, dude, this is like impact. And um, yeah. but if you're watching on TNT, you're watching a game. It sounds beautiful. Like you, you hear everything going on. But for whatever reason, on NBA League Pass, it's just this shit audio quality. 
Right. You know, so. And that's because, like, listen, when it comes to production across the board, uh, the general rule on behalf of the company is let's get this done as cheaply as possible. Right. And, um, and, but the problem is that it comes across it. That's why the, the word production value exists. Production value means making something look or sound expensive, even though it's really not expensive. Mm-hmm. Right. Cause the company who you're working for doesn't want it to be expensive. They just want it to look and sound good. And that's why what Impact needs is not necessarily to spend more money on production, but they need better production quality in uh, in, 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 their, in in their product. Yeah, and the point I was just making was exactly what you said. Had I not, you know, if I only watched NBA League Pass, I probably wouldn't notice the difference. But because I watch TNT or whatever, ABC, whatever showing it, I have something to compare it to. And I'm like, wow, the, you know, this is, this sounds I'm sorry, horrible. production value. I said production, I said production quality. I meant production value. You said value. Oh, okay. Yeah. Brain so, brain. Um, so uh, you know, shout out. Um, I, I, I do want to give props to uh, Andrew on Twitter. He goes by Impact Andrew, his, his Twitter handle. He was the one that really looked into the audio quality. Uh, he, sent, he sent me some screenshots that, you know, through his software, because he does uh, video ed- engineering as well, or audio engineering. Um, he was showing me actual screenshots of the the uh, the mono uh, yeah the mono channels. You know he was showing me BTI, and then he was showing me Impact, and then he was showing me the pictures as well, the actual uh, what we see on screen. And he was you know you could obviously see like the color correction on Impact compared to BTI was just very very different. Right. So, um, but yeah, that that's going to be a problem if if it is mixed down to a mono channel. That that is a big time shortcut you take because yeah, mixing down to mono is going to be a smaller file. Absolutely, right. But you you uh, it hurts the sound quality a lot. And you know, I, I mentioned all you know a lot that I used to be you know used to do music and everything. And the average listener of music doesn't know the difference, but it, but the artist never wanted to get away from cd quality audio right like we got rid of cds and we went to mp3s the sound quality of an mp3 is so different than a cd because you you have it in its purest form on a compact disc and now cds don't exist so you know audio music has taken a big hit in that sense now the untrained ear probably can't mm-hmm. tell the difference but if you were really to just you know a b test it and let me listen to mp3 next to a cd you would hear oh shit, you know it, it is much much different so um it's a shortcut maybe they have to maybe it's a time sensitive thing i i don't know uh i would imagine mixing down a two-hour show probably takes uh probably more than 24 hours for it to export all the way down i'm sure that it does you know just our podcast here takes half an hour to to uh you know this is zoom you know, it takes a half hour to, to export down. So I can only imagine, especially something that might be in HD, how long it takes. But it's it's still an, a very unnecessary shortcut that you're hoping the naked ear can't hear, the untrained ear can't hear the difference. But clearly, Impact fans have been saying for a while, we can't hear the fans. Uh, we, sometimes we can't hear the, the entrance music for anything, you know. Mm-hmm. And then with this episode... Whew, I saw people talking about this on Twitter before I saw before I watched the show. Josh Alexander cutting the promo and Scott and Jay White sounded like dog shit. Mm. There was an echo. I don't I don't know what it was though. Uh, and I I do have a little bit of experience with with sound equipment, but I I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was because it was a bigger venue and there was some kind of echo. I don't think that's what it was, but there was some kind of feedback, man. That it sounded horrible. It sounded so, so cheap. Oh, yeah. You know what? It sounded, you know what it sounded like? What it sounded like to me, my first thought was like, it makes it sound like this building is empty. That's what it, that's what I was thinking. Like, like when Jay White was on the mic and he was talking, I just felt like I was just hearing such an echo and it made me feel like, you know, like, 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 like there's speakers in the, in a cavernous building that is not filled with people. And so like, again like if you go into an auditorium that's empty and you're like hello 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 yeah. like that's kind of like what it, what it what it sounded like i was like man this is oh 
this gives me uh flashbacks of um what was that place they used to go uh bethlehem pennsylvania yeah when they used to film in bethlehem pennsylvania it's it, it it always sounded like just they were in it sounded like they were in like some cavernous building and the the sound was just like so like oh my god you know um yeah. and so yeah I, I was getting some flashbacks of that uh no, i came across one of the bethel um, pop tv bethlehem pennsylvania I, it was a video clip of something i don't remember what it was and uh it might have been mike bennett's debut mm -hmm. I'm fairly certain it was. If you go back and watch that on YouTube, you can. I, I remember complaining back then, like you can't hear the crowd. Right. You go. You listen. To, watch. Listen to that back on YouTube. The crowd is loud as shit. Like it's loud, loud. And I'm like, man. I mean, there's no comparison from that to to what's going on right now. So it's it's a clear like dip in quality. You know, yeah. where it should be like getting better. It's a clear dip. Like. Look up Mike Bennett's debut on YouTube and, and tell me that is not night and day compared to what we hear right now on screen. So uh, do that, folks. You know, drop some knowledge in the comments about it. Um, you're you're going to hear a major difference. Right. So. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, so, you know, and, and again, I think that the important thing for us to understand here is that these these things seem fixable. Right. Like they seem fixable. Um, not saying they don't cost money but they're fixable. And I think that if you're impact, right? Like, I mean, you, you, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta put the bait out there to get the fish. You know what I mean? Like um, you, you just gotta, you, you gotta just get the, put the best product out there. Like stop letting these little things slide, you know, like these little things become big things when people watch your product and it feels subpar. You don't right. want that impact. So, and that's where you are right now. Like these little things you're letting slide because storyline wise, you got some great shows going on. You got some great shows. You got interesting characters going on, you know, um, you know, uh, people participating on the show that you don't normally see. Like Impact has a lot going for it, but the, the, little, the little things that we're talking about, like they're distracting. They take away from enjoying you know, the good stuff about the show when you're like, oh man, like, why is it echoing like that? I feel like I don't hear this on any other wrestling show. You know right. what I mean? Like, stop giving people the opportunity to have to talk about that stuff. Stop giving the people who hate on Impact the, the ammunition to just have something else to shit on you with. You know what I mean? Like, the, help yourself. Help me help you, okay? Yeah, if I was tuning into Impact for the first time or the first time in a while or I watched casually or whatever, because this was like the first part of the show, wasn't it? I think uh, it was. Yeah, it was very early, I feel like. Yeah, yeah. So if I was watching that to kick off the show, I'd be like, dude, I, I can't listen to this. Right. You know, like I, I would just I would just shut it off, you know. Um, so, man, I, we won't we won't, you know, talk about that anymore or any more for today, but it's. It's a turnoff, and um, yes. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I really don't know, dude, because it's how long have we been pointing this out? Now I'm giving some specifics because I've been looking into it, and, I, and I'm getting the specifics. Now I know how the audio is coming out. Now I know how uh, or how it's being mixed down. I know how it's being edited color correction-wise. Like, now I see, you know, but for the longest time, I was like, dude, something's not wrong. Something's not right with all this, right. and we're, we're not seeing or hearing improvement at all there's lots of improvement in just about every other area i've been saying that since 2022 hit like they're, they're just fixing everything everything is is better uh but the backstage stuff you know the if the uh morrissey's backstage segment from last week man his skin was just orange like a pumpkin <laughs> and that's that's that um contrast setting you pull it all the way to the right it is going to make those blacks dark but but skin tones are also um gonna gonna start looking unnatural as well so yeah i actually I, I experiment with that a little bit myself just um on my television so i have um i have a i have an lg television and um it's my second lg tv uh like when i first when i first uh a few years ago i got um uh, i want to say it's like a 65 inch lg tv and i loved it like i you know i thought the color was great sounds great i, was like, I mean it's a great quality product i really love it 
and then I was in the I was in the market for a bigger TV. So I got the bigger TV and I also got an LG, but the color is not nearly as good, man. Not nearly as good. Like the color on the smaller one was perfect. Perfect. And I've been messing around with the color on this bigger TV ever since I got it, trying to get it to match what's on um what's on the smaller TV. Like even to the point where I went and looked at the specific number settings for each category and applied them to the bigger TV and it still doesn't look the same. So like, um, obviously part of that is like contrast, contrast and tint and color and all the things like that. And I noticed like, you know, when you push certain things to certain sides, people get really orange or really red and you know, all of that stuff. And obviously that's not the look you want to go for when you're, uh, when you're trying to colorize something. So it is interesting as to why they do that. Like why they let it, you know, is, is that an oversight? And if it's an oversight, it's a poor quality oversight, you know? So I I can tell you, I mean, I don't want to disrespect the people that, that that do the post-production, but my experience which goes back a long way when it comes to, especially with graphic editing, is that people who do that are in the very early stages of editing. Mm. Because to, to their eye, the more you do to it, that, well, this looks really cool. Right. You know? right. Um, and then over the years, you're like, oh, wait, that's, that's way too much. Mm. So I know now that less is more. But I know when I first started doing editing, or not editing, but... Uh, yeah, photo editing, because um, I used to be real into touching up photos, you know, mm. uh, making them sharper, airbrush, uh, color correction, uh, all, all sorts of stuff, because um, I I went to school, uh, well, my very first certificate that I ever got was in graphic design years and years ago. So I've just been around this, that, that industry for a really long time, and it's usually a sign of someone who's in the very early stages of, of messing with this stuff. Is right. where you're just like, ooh, let me see, you know, what 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 this does. Ooh, this looks really cool if I turn it all the way up. Like anyone who is a true true expert in that kind of stuff knows less is more. You know, they mm. know not to do that. So uh, that just again, I don't know those people, so I, I don't want to disrespect them. But that it is a sign of, you know, of amateurs. Being a- amateurs. That's what you're saying. You're saying they look like amateurs. And listen, and this is not disrespect to the people who are doing this because I think it's very important. Um, you know, when you work in uh, in production, it's it's a thankless job. And um, if production doesn't look good, then you get all the heat. But you still don't get the heat because people really don't know who you are. And the heat really goes on the company, which, again, you know, makes makes production's job hard because the blowback then would be on you. But truly, the blowback is on the company because they got to do a better job of hiring. And I'm not, and, and again, like that's no disrespect to the people who have those jobs, but I'm just saying that you got to know, right? When you're putting this product out, this is the company's forward facing product. Okay. This is what people look at and see as representative of the company. So you got to know, you know what I mean? Like you got to know. And I will say this, even if your editors are brand new and learning, you got to have some quality control uh measures in place you know what i'm saying like if i'm if i'm producing a show and i have uh and i have like a a a, a production assistant who makes topic bars that say fuck you you know what i mean like if (laughs) i let that air that's on me right that's on me because i there's there's measures in place where that shouldn't happen Right. So it's like, is it their fault for doing it? Yes. Should they have done a better job? Yes. Should they be reprimanded for doing it? Yes. But whose name is on the show? Mine. So if it gets on air, I'm going to take the hit. You know what I'm saying? Because I should have checked that before I put it on the air. So same thing here. Right. Like, like there's a there's a chain of command thing. So like they, they need to have somebody in the um, in the realm of quality control who looks these things over before they hit the air and says, is Deanna Perrazzo supposed to be that orange? If not, let's fix this. Right. Yeah, exactly. So I don't want to keep, I know I just said, I probably said five minutes ago, we're not going to talk, keep talking about it. And here we are still talking about it. Sorry. So, it's, <laughs> you know, it just obviously. Damn it, it's interesting. Yeah. Obviously it's just something that has to, it has to be fixed. And um, 
hopefully it happens you know yes Ho- hopefully that, um, that that is going to turn people away what else what, what what else outside the outside of the episode of impact has uh sparked your interest this week nothing really to be honest i don't i don't think there's uh you know i scoured the news uh before we came on here there was nothing that i felt was really worth talking about all right all right so how about we dive into you know what i want to do uh i want to check how the uh how this how the seats are selling for the upcoming um the upcoming weekend uh what's the event they're having is it turning point i don't even know i don't believe so is it no surrender (laughs) no uh maybe yeah go on twitter man I think we already yeah, had Turning Point. Turning Point was the the really good show they had in uh, November. Oh yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right, that's so, right, that's right. So I, I'm, go. I'm gonna look it up as we're talking here. The February nineteenth, you know, you know, no surrender. Okay, there's no surrender. No surrender, and let's see how you know, we're it's doing. Odd. It's yeah. odd, man. The monthly specials, for some reason, I I cannot remember the names ever because they, in my head, they all they're all like the same name. I don't, I don't know if that, that probably makes no sense, but just everything, I don't know. When they used to do the Twitch shows, I always thought those had really, really unique names. Uh, you know, they were, they were kind of, you know, I, I'm trying to think what some of them were. I don't remember, but, but yeah, the Impact Plus shows, man, it just, I don't know. The names just don't, don't stick out in my head. Yeah. Um, so looking at the seating map, they're doing a little better, but like incrementally better. They're doing incrementally better. Um, I really want to see these seats go, man. I really want to see these seats go, man. I just, oh man, Impact is doing so good right now, man. And so, you know, maybe they'll get a great walk up. You know, maybe they'll get a great walk up. But I would say that just looking at the seating map right now, and you can you can tell me what you think, but I would say, looking at the seating map, I would say that they're probably at about... 70 percent sold okay. um which is not bad you know it's it's not bad um but like like i said man like first of all d- just looking at this if this seating map is accurate this is the most people they've had set up since they've gone back to live tapings this is the most most floor seats they've had set up since they've gone back to live tapings would you agree yeah if, if it's hitting that 70 percent capacity absolutely because with these tapings here in florida it doesn't look like there's a whole crap load of people there and now i i think i remember someone posting a, tw- a twitter video and, and there's definitely more than it the than there perceives to be from what we see on the screen but yeah, yeah. i would still venture to say it's probably on the lower end of, of, of sales and you know i said this maybe a month or so ago two months ago when they, they first announced these venues, I said, you know, I lived in Florida for six or seven years and that is just not a wrestling hotbed. I know NXT was doing his thing with in Orlando and obviously Impact was doing Orlando, but to me as a resident there, it, I didn't find it to be a hotbed for wrestling. Granted, I didn't go up and down the state, but mm. I just did it. Um, right. It's not even a hotbed for sports period. Like you can go to any any city there that has a sports team and you don't see nothing. You don't see them wearing anything. It's right. it's just, you know. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if it, I don't think it was a great spot. I, I just don't. But yeah, you know, maybe or- New Orleans is. I think uh, it makes think me curious. That's like, why, why pick those spots? Like, is it because those venues are cheaper to rent? Probably. That's probably what it is. If you if you pick venues that like are in the middle of nowhere, you know they're probably cheaper to rent out the space. But again, man, like you know that places like Philly and Chicago, you know uh, places in Texas, you know just have like rabid wrestling fan bases that are going to come out and and if they want to see a good wrestling show. And now they got I'm saying this now they got a show in Philly coming up next month, I think. I think the tickets just went on sale for um, their, 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 they're going to be in Philly in March. And so, you know, we're going to see, but, but I, I just think that like, Oh man, I think this is one of those things where like, again, we as fans want it for them. I think they want it too, man. I think they want it too. And I, I want to give these guys credit because they are 
taking the swing and booking bigger venues and you know trying to sell i just i want to see i want to see the sale happen man i want to see it happen i really want um to just see impact like i I think for the performers the performers deserve it you know what i mean the chris bays of the world you know what i mean let me tell you something this week this week in the last in the last week i've seen people that perform for impact uh or recently have performed for impact tweet um i'm broke this weekend i've seen them tweet my 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 car tires are bald you know what I mean? And like, I'm like, bro, like if you wrestle on a worldwide platform, you should never have to say that or think that or or that just should not be true. You know what I mean? Un- unless you're like, you know, have some sort of crazy habits that are sucking up your money. Like you, that should never be the case. If you wrestle on a nationwide platform, a worldwide platform, it should never be the case that you're out here hurting for money. That you're like, oh man, my birthday is this weekend. I don't know what I'm gonna do because yada yada yada. Like, that's trash, man. That is trash. And that's that's one thing where you know impact gotta do better, man. Impact gotta do better. I think that um, you know, at some point, I th- I think at some point, like, I don't know, listen, they'll do better if the fans demand better. That's what it comes down to. I, I feel right. like if the fans are like, you know, look, man, like, you know, we want y'all to lock these wrestlers up to long-term deals or whatever. You know, I think the fans can push them towards doing stuff like that, but they got to do it with their dollars. You know, they got to do it with their dollars. Like, if you want to support Chris Bay, buy up his damn merch. You know what I mean? So they see that Chris Bay is worth is somebody worth investing in. Although we know Chris Bay had the biggest selling shirt there for a while, and they still don't appear to be doing anything with him. So what do I know? All right. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so on BTI this week, the uh, aforementioned Lady Frost. She had a match with your favorite, Alicia Edwards. And um, we don't usually talk about the BTI match, but because, you know, this is, this is Alicia Frost. This is, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Alicia Frost. There we go. We're going to call this Alicia Frost. I like that name. Yeah. This is Alicia Frost match. We're going to talk about this. Okay. So top knockouts collide as they look to move up the rankings ladder. Alicia and Frost roll around the ring, jockeying for position on multiple pin attempts. Frost hits a running net breaker. Alicia connects with a series of kicks followed by a flatliner for two. Alicia plants Frost face first, Frost face first, into the apron to remain in control. Alicia charges into the corner, but Frost catches her with a sleeper hold. Frost hits an all-inspiring handspring cannonball followed by the temperature drop to win. So, um... I thought this was interesting, and I think that like this description doesn't necessarily do this, uh, doesn't do this, do this the the credit it deserves. So there was one part where um, Lady Frost she starts in one corner, Alicia is like laying in the other corner, and Lady Frost comes across the ring and does like a forward tumble and into like a cannonball, and it, it, it looked really dope. It looked really really dope, um, and then. As we were talking about earlier, she hit her moonsault called the, what does she call it? The temperature drop? The temperature yeah. drop for the win. But, like, she completely overshot the, the, the moonsault and, like, she totally missed Alicia Edwards. But it made me ask the question, by how much do you want to miss? You know what I mean? Like, is it, I think we imagine a moonsault as landing, like, belly to belly. But do you ideally want to land, like, chest to belly? You know, like, the, like, like, what do you think is like the ideal landing position for a moonsault? Dude, I don't know, man. It, it seems like more often than not, it's like chest to legs. Mm. Which that doesn't make any sense to me. Maybe that's no. just the, what, what it's got to be a very difficult move to nail to like hit the way you want it to hit. Right. But it seems like more often than not, it's like kind of, you know, chest to legs. Remember those Kurt Angle moonsaults? Kurt Angle would shoot overshoot the moonsault so bad. It would yeah. be like Kurt Angle would like land with like a headbutt. <laughs> like, you know, like, why did you do a backflip headbutt to somebody's shoulder? Right. Uh, <laughs> but yes, yeah, so this is this is curious. And, and again, if anybody out there is a wrestler, school me on this. School us. Educate me. Um, after the match, the quintessential diva Giselle Shaw made her impact debut as she stole the spotlight from Lady Frost after her victory. So Giselle Shaw, she's like walking around the ring, you know, strutting her stuff. And you can just see Lady Frost in the background like, excuse me, 
skew. <laughs> and so I thought that was actually, that was a lot of fun. Um, they they memed some of the pictures of uh, Lady Frost kind of like looking at Giselle Shaw as she's like, you know, stunting around the ring trying to show off after Lady Frost has won a match. That's like, that's like proposing to, to your fiance at somebody else's wedding. Like, you don't do that. You don't do that. <laughs> yeah. that's, 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 that's in poor taste. Meanwhile, Alicia's like, man, these these two chicks are brand new. They already got a feud. I'm still waiting on my first feud after five years. Oh, man. Um, wow. You, you know, you mentioned in that recap that Alicia hit the flatliner for two. And we talked about this, I think, on the mailbag show where I was like, dude, the flatliner's her finisher. No one would know it because she's never won. But when she does use it, people <laughs> kick out of it. it. That's true. It's like it hasn't yo, finished anything. <laughs> no, uh, it, it's like Virgil, man. Virgil. So for a long time, when Virgil was like a relevant wrestler, he used to use the million dollar dream. After that feud was over, he started becoming a jobber. His finisher was the just the side Russian leg sweep, mm-hmm. and he used to win on superstars and wrestling challenge. He he would still he would win with the move, but the minute he wrestled someone good, like he would he would hit that because back then people didn't kick out of finishers. Uh, he would hit that side Russian leg sweep and they would just kick out. Like, right. I'm like well, because it's just a regular fucking move. Right. Yeah. Right, right, right. It's regular schmegler. But, but, but listen, but also I would say that's the cool thing about wrestling. Like, we can sit here and say that the side Russian leg sweep is just a regular schmegler move. But if you make it your finishing move, it's a devastating side Russian leg sweep or yeah. whatever you want to call it. It's the 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 money neck breaker or you know what i mean like whatever yeah, the bq yeah. you know like i, I remember um <laughs> i believe it was one it was one time uh james storm was on uh stone cold steve austin's podcast and he was asking him about the super kick and he was saying you know hey a lot of people do a super kick and um james storm said yeah that's true but i beat people with mine and like that just told me that like, yeah, no, you're right, bro. Like the difference is in how you present it, how you protect it. Like, yes, the, you know, uh, everyone does a million super kicks in every match, but if yours ends matches, then it's special, you mm-hmm. know? So, right. you know, I think that like, that's just that it's, it's all about like protecting the move, you know, protecting mm-hmm. the move. So you have a great match. And if your matches end with a super kick, that's great. Um, it, it, the super kick, st- the super kick is still effective when you hit it, you know, right? Like you could make a wrestler, um, you, you could bring back the bear hug. You know what I mean? Like if he's winning with it, if Bobby Lashley is beating people with the full Nelson, I'm just going to bring that up. Yeah. Yeah. The, the full Nelson, you know what I mean? I put yeah. my kids in the full, I'm, I'm like, hurt lock. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, but yeah man like it's that's that's the beauty of wrestling man like the fans believe what you show them so that's that all and right you know, we talk about lady frost finisher wait till y'all see giselle, giselle shaw's finisher i haven't seen her finisher so oh, i gotta I, say i've never seen giselle shaw at all so i hope she's good i hope she's good because the impact uh the knockouts could definitely use like a nice uh just a nice infusion of like excitement to just you know to just add to the ranks, you know what I mean? Create more competition, add more variety. Um, I just think that that could be really dope. Um, yeah. So, all right, here we go. Into the episode of Impact. So Josh Alexander kicks off the episode as he grabs a microphone in the ring. Alexander says that if there's one thing that's more important to him than the Impact World title, it's Impact Wrestling itself. And that's why he's proud to go to war with Honor No More, bars at no surrender. Alexander goes on to question why the unhinged W. Morrissey has been given an Impact World title shot when Scott Demore told him to keep his emotions in check. Uh, Alexander declares that whether it's Moose or Morrissey who walks out of no surrender with the Impact World title, he will be next in line. And in a shocking turn of events, Big Khan made his Impact debut and confronts Alexander in the ring. Alexander doesn't back down and demands a referee so they can fight right here, right now. So for those of you who did not see it, Big Khan is the bigger guy from the uh, the ascension of uh, former NXT and WWE fame. And um, this was... <laughs> I hope they only booked this guy for this one night. I was going to say the same thing. 
you because you brought this dude in here and um and 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 you just could not have gotten punked out worse like he comes in and he towers over Josh Alexander right and Josh Alexander is dope man i i say all the time how they don't do enough to make Josh Alexander feel like a star when i watched Josh Alexander in this segment right here it showed me every reason why he is a star right so you had this, you brought this dude out who towers over Josh Alexander and he comes out and he's threatening him and Josh Alexander was just giving him those eyes, dog. Those eyes that was like, yo, I'm about to rip your freaking face off and you just, you know, you don't even know what you just stepped into. And the way that he just shrugged off the mean looks that this dude was giving him. And I was like, yo, you're dead. You are dead in the water. Like, it's, it's like everything you tell kids about standing up to bullies. Like, we saw it right there. You Like, you tell kids, like, yo, look, listen, that bully is actually really insecure. And if you stand up to him, he's probably not as tough as he's acting, right? You, yo, I, am, am I lying? Like, you could see the intensity drain out of this man's face when he looked into Josh Alexander's eyes. And I was like, holy shit. Like, yo, like, you, like, he just punked you. I was like, yo, you know this is staged, right? Like, you know, like, you look like you just realized you did not want those, that, that smoke. And, um, and he tapped him out in like two seconds. I was like, oh my God, you may never show your face around here again. Like, that was awful. That was terrible. That was yeah. terribly awful. And, and I, I'm like, I just, I, 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 I don't even know what to say, man. Like, like. Oh my God. Like you, I listen, you get, you got a paycheck. That's what they asked you to do more power to you. But I don't know how you recover for that from that as a character. Like, I think you need six months off TV again. Okay. Just go home, work on your stuff. <laughs> and like, don't get punked out by people in the ring with you in a kayfabe situation. Um, because that was, that was bad. I just wrote um, what the, uh, so part of me likes the concept of where jo Josh is like, oh, let me guess another obstacle. We're not doing this next week, two weeks from now. We're going to do this now. He's in his regular clothes. I like that. That was, that was a whole, that's what they were trying to get over. That's what they, the story they were trying to tell. That was part of, uh, what led into the next segment. But like you said, I hope he never. And, and I'm, uh, dude, I, I, I'm an Ascension guy. I am. I, I know you don't really care for them. I wanted to see them in Impact. Um, I hope he never comes back because that better have been his only match because that shit was horrible. Like, how do you recover you, from that? Like, how do you that, recover from that? <laughs> can't. And Impact is not the best at like let's re rehabilitate this guy. Right. You know they're they're not. We saw with Rich Swan when he. Lost with uh, Kenny Omega. They they did absolutely nothing to get Rich Swan back on track after that. They had him lose his next match, you know? Uh, and then I, we've talked about Larry D and these dudes that, like, once they just lose on – like, you can't – you can bring them back. You can get anybody right. hot. Right. But th that is not their strong point. Right. They have proven that that's not their strong point. You right. know, it took them forever to get – uh, Rohit Raju on a point that we took him seriously because they beat him so much, but he worked really, really hard on his end. And which is, I, I was going to say that that's a credit to him. That's yeah. a credit to him because like, you know, you just said it, right? Like we watched this guy lose for two, three years. And then when they gave him a shot, he made it work. Yeah. So, so that, that's total credit to him, but you were saying, but you know, that, that's just the point. They, they, um, you know, Go, Reno scum. I'm, I'm thinking. I'm just bringing up recent guys here. Once they, once they lose so much, you can't. The, you can bring them back. They just don't. They've right, never right. been that. They haven't been that way. So, right. I can't imagine this dude shows up on screen again. Because I mean, what the, what the hell? He didn't even get to talk. He didn't even go down and say anything. He, right, he just right. went down there and lost. Like you, you gotta, you gotta be secure in your, Ooh. in yourself, and. I hope they paid you more than your your asking rate because to just go there, you ain't been on TV in years. Right. And, you know, he's a big enough name to where there's going to be social media hits on this. Right. People, oh, shit, the, one of the Ascension dudes showed up. We haven't seen those guys. And, like, people are going to click on it. 
I bet yeah. if you go to their shit ass YouTube, like that video, that clip has more than the rest of the things that happen on the show. I don't know mm-hmm. that for sure, but I'm I'm going to assume it's it's pretty close to it. And people were, and, and so so people were seeing it, and you know you got to be pretty pretty secure in yourself because yeah, you know you can't be taken serious after that. Yeah, if he yeah, lost, but yeah, but actually like had like the dude wasn't even dressed to wrestle. <laughs> like you got to jump on him, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, oh, yeah, that was that was rough. That was rough. But I think that like the um, you know, again, and we'll talk about this some more as we go on. But I think like the flip side of that is Josh Alexander looked and sounded like a total badass dog, like a total badass. Yeah. Like again, I can't stress enough. Like if you guys don't, re- if, if if this didn't come across to you, go back and watch that segment again. Like this dude comes out and gets in Josh Alexander's face, and he like screams on him. And I, I'm telling you, you can see it when Josh Alexander looks up back in his eyes and he shrinks. The man is like damn near six inches taller than Josh Alexander, and he shrinks. And he's like, "Oh shit, I'm in for a fucking ass with him." <laughs> and like, and 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 I was like, "Dog, like this is just like that made Josh Alexander look like he was ten feet tall." And that was that was so that's what you want, right? That's what you want. These are the moments Josh Alexander needs. He's been having them, and this is just a credit to Impact. Like you know, they have stayed on track with this. They've stayed on track with this, but. Um, here's the thing that I think can't go unspoken or understated in this segment. Who sent that dude? Who sent him out there? Who gave him the green light to come out and get in Josh Alexander's face for a match? Like, it these are questions Charlie. that have to be asked. Right, and, Charlie Haas, all that, yeah. Right, 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 right. Like, like uh, apparently somebody is opening the door for these people and letting them in and giving them a green light to come in here and have a match. That would have to be somebody who has some sort of executive power, mm-hmm. right? Some sort of authority of some kind. Um, so, 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 you know, I, I, I have an idea of where this might be going, but let's just, let's just, let's just, let's, let's see what happened next. Um, and I hope it does go that way because that makes sense. That is common sense. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, it, it was like during that the uh, when EC3 kept showing up and attacking Moose, and they're mm-hmm. how, how do you, he doesn't even work here. I'm right. like, you're gonna tell me in the pandemic era of wrestling with a closed set, this dude just <laughs> he just got in the building. Right. You know, like there's you got to use some kind of common sense here. So I hope that they do something like that so that it makes sense. I don't trust that they will, but I hope so. That's true. So uh, after Josh San- Josh Alexander beat him like a bitch, he wouldn't break the hold, and uh, that prompted security to hit the ring. Alexander attacked them as Impact Executive Vice President Scott Demore approaches from the back. Not realizing who it is, Alexander turns around and immediately pushes him to the mat. Demore reminisces about Alexander's journey to the top of Impact Wrestling and asked him, what more do you want? Alexander says that he doesn't want to be the only world champion in this company's history who didn't have the belt long enough to put it around his waist. Demore agrees that the goal is to have Josh Alexander be the face of Impact Wrestling as the world champion, but he has to go through the process. Alexander is done with the process and says that if Demore doesn't give him what he wants, give me what I want, he'll leave Impact. Demore tells Alexander that he's out of Team Impact versus Honor No More, uh, the match at No Surrender, and he's sending him home until this issue is sorted out. Woo! So, um, th- th- that synopsis was 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 fine, but I think that like, talk to me about like uh, about like how you felt actually watching this. I felt like, you know, again. This is obviously a plot device designed to make Josh, Josh Alexander the hero. Um, it appears that Scott Demore is going to be, at least they want us to think that Scott Demore is is the uh, the force behind these things that are happening against Josh Alexander. And so, I mean, like it, th- this could be very fun. 
right? This could be very fun. This could be something where we end up with, you know, Josh Alexander versus the corporation. You know what I mean? I hate using WWE terms, but like, right. you know, but but to, to set an example of like, you know, uh, in this case, you know, Scott Demore is the string puller, you know, maybe Moose is the headliner and you have a few more goons that are all at Demore's disposal to, you know, to, to foil Josh Alexander. And I like it, you know, I, I like it. It's a, it's an old school type of storyline, but it works for me. Um, and I've seen a lot of conversation on social media this past week, wondering whether or not uh, the Josh Alexander contract rift is actually a real thing. What do you think about that? So first I got to say, I thought that Josh and Scott have never sounded better. This was to me their best. As, as annoying as I find Scott do more, especially with his constant need to be like, Josh, Josh. <laughs> Excuse me. That made me cough. That trying to get in a Scott and more voice. I thought this was the best he had sounded. Uh, the material that he delivered was good. Josh sounded really, really good. Josh is improving a lot. I don't say he was ever bad on the microphone, but it was just always like a little white meat. Like, I think he, I think that the perception of him was that he was like this quiet assassin. He was never asked to talk much. And then being in a tag team with Ethan Page, who's like all personality, I think like Josh just slid into that role as the quote unquote quiet one. And I didn't know he could talk. You know what I mean? I didn't know he could talk. Yeah. He, they never really let him talk. He was just say a little something here or there, you know? But um, but yeah, like he um, he he really he he when he was in the north, he didn't really get a chance to shine from a personality standpoint. So I think that um, this is a little bit surprising for people to see him actually show personality. And th they're not asking for a ton of range here, right? Like this is this is rage. They're asking him for rage, and he's delivering though, right? Like he's delivering. Like again, yo, like. He shrunk somebody who was like four inches taller than him, like with his eyes. <laughs> so, <laughs> and for, for everybody out there, you can't back down. Once you commit to a fight, just fucking do it. You might know you're going to get your ass kicked, but just get your punches in, man. Don't let somebody shrink you like that just because they look crazy. Okay. <laughs> just if you commit to it, do what you got to do. <laughs> now, there's a lot of people out there with their tinfoil hats on with opinions on what really going on here. Right. Um, but I'm going to put my tinfoil hat on for a second here. Uh oh. Because I think, so let's, we, we've, we've talked James Storm here. I've, I've, I've talked about Pop TV. If you go back a couple of years, more than a couple of years, a few years, there was a moment where James Storm left the company, wrestled two matches on NXT, returned to Impact, and it was a, huge news topic because uh, back then it was you know it was a bit forbidden if you will to see <laughs> people come on nxt so you know like when samoa joe showed up and stuff like that that was now well, i shouldn't say now but the last several years you see someone come from impact or roh whatever that's just everyday business but back then you didn't see someone from another company like go and sign there. That just, that didn't really happen. Um, and, and for those that it did happen, they were repackaged, right. you know, uh, Kevin Owens and uh, he wasn't even there at the time, but uh, Sami Zayn, you know, they're, they're all repackaged. So, you know, we didn't have someone show up as the person we saw in another company. So when James Storm ended up popping up on TNA, and saving Bobby Roode, like that was a huge talking point in a wrestling role. Like, people were like, why the hell would you go back there? Like you could have went to NXT and don't get me wrong. I'm pretty sure James storm would, would change things. If you could go back, don't get me wrong, but there's an opportunity here for something very similar like that to happen. You know, when I, when I, a lot of people think he's already signed and, and this and this, and that, it, that, that it's a work, it's possible, but there there could be a lot of traffic here because Josh Alexander's the dude you got to get people behind. They name dropped him on AEW a couple of weeks ago. A lot of people went, "Oh, but I don't know that they knew who it was." Or I, I, 
they might have had an idea who it was. I, I don't really know. I'm not for sure. But he's not a household name. Impact needs him to be one. So I, I really could see a scenario here. Again, if my tinfoil hat is on, but I'm comparing it to James Storm. I can see a scenario where he does end up wrestling a couple matches on AEW, whether it's a Rampage or, or whatever. I don't think he's going to just show up one day and expect people are, oh, my God, Josh. He's not going to be like a surprise run in. And just, I don't think he's well known enough to do that. But I can see some kind of scenario where he does show up on the show, wrestles a couple matches, and then he, you know, people speculate, like, is he all elite now? And then he returns to Impact. And if it was that same type of story they did with James Storm, they did it with Josh Alexander, uh, he would become more of a household name overnight. I mean, it, it would there would be more traffic and search engine traffic, social media, YouTube, whatever, around him than any other time. If they were if they did something like that, if he just shows up again on our episode of Impact, he's in the same place that he's in right now. So, you know, so I think it's a possibility. To to what would it benefit AEW to do that? Uh, I don't think that it would benefit him a whole lot, other than uh, Tony Khan has a hard on for the Forbidden Door. You know, like you saw him this week, he was teasing like motherfuckers. Guess. You got to tune the fuck in. Right. Sorry, right. I'm cursing a lot there. And then it ended up being, you know, Keith Lee and, and uh, Jay White, which we'll talk about that here in a bit. And there was a lot of people disappointed mm. with that. Um, because when you te- – I think those were – I mean, I thought Keith Lee looked really cool. I was watching the episode with my old lady, and I said – you know, I don't usually watch wrestling live, but I said, yo, this full Tony Khan had – is telling me to watch the episode. <laughs> so it worked. I tuned in. Um, and her as a very uh, casual wrestling fan, really liked Keith Lee because he looked mm. he looked and wrestled different than he acted. Everything about him was different than everyone else on that show. So she really enjoyed watching him. But there was a lot of people who were disappointed in it. Wow. And um, he, I mean, he's, he's just, but he's got a heart. He just under, he overpromised and underdelivered in a lot of ways but he, he yeah. does have a hard on for the forbidden door okay so that's why that's where i think it would be a splash i think it, it would definitely be a splash yeah i think it would definitely be a splash from aw's standpoint but i think that like it would be a big boost for impact nah not, maybe not a big boost but i think it would be really i think it'd be a really cool thing for impact i could see something like that happening um i just feel like for from the previous experience between Impact and AEW, it seems like Tony Khan is really just going to be here for the things that benefit him. You know right. what I mean? Um, like, look at the way he protected Kenny Omega in their dealings with Impact. Uh, you know, even the manner in which that title came off of him, I just thought that was that was weak. I thought that was really weak. Um, you know, like at least let them get their title back. You know what I mean? Let them get their title back. Even if you want to have him drop the other title first and then have him get this title back, like I thought that would have been, you know, come on, man. You know, I, I think you you owe it. You owe it to them. The difference, though, is that they did name drop Josh Alexander on the show. They did. And- I totally agree. And I think I think that was I think that wasn't for nothing. But I also don't know that it wasn't for nothing. Like I, you know, I think sometimes we might give AEW a little too much credit. You know, I think AEW does yeah. a lot of things for the sake of doing them. You know what I mean? Like yeah, th- yeah. We, we talked about this uh, last week, like with the with the TNT title, right? It was just like we want to do the ladder match with two belts. We want to do it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. come on, man! Like Cody Rhodes is off TV. He missed one episode of Dynamite, and they crowned an interim champion. Like, yeah. bro, come on, dog. Come or on. They did that. They did the uh, Hangman Page and. Uh, Lance Archer Texas death match for their first encounter. It, it was kind of, it, it was even kind of like Morrissey and Myers at the same time though. It's their first match and it's a no DQ, but, but this is more extreme, a Texas death match. Like it was the first time they wrestled. Right. There was no reason to go, you know, zero to a hundred. Oh my God. You know, oh so yeah, they God. do shit just to do it, man. Hashtag AEW shit. 
All right. Uh, um, I was watching. Yeah. So I was watching. Uh, I gotta say real quick. I was watching. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it was Dynamite or it was Noah's Rampage. And I was thinking, man, I'm so glad Impact isn't like this. Jungle Boy, who I fucking hate, takes <laughs> takes uh, Austin Gunn's finisher on the floor on the outside, mm-hmm. and then they roll him in the ring. Colton Gunn hits him with the belt, and this and he kicks out. And then two minutes later, he turns around and hits his uh, hits a uh, Christian's finisher, just a regular finisher on one of the guns and beats him and it was like i i mean some guys like i I said you have to shoot them in the chest with a gun (laughs) to lose on that show (laughs) did you ever see uh what's that movie the last boy scout is that the movie where the dude is running on the football field and he pulls out a gun and starts shooting people (laughs) i didn't see that no, it's uh, crazy. It's, it's, it's one of the wildest scenes you're ever going to see. I think it was the uh, the last Boy Scout, Keenan Ivory Waynes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a throwback for you. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> that was yeah. wild. All right. So after being attacked by Honor No More last week, Steve Macklin tells Scott Demore that he wants to be Josh Alexander's replacement on Team Impact. Demore says that he'll have to consult with the other team members first. Deanna Perazzo is in the ring to issue her open challenge for either the AAA Reina De Reina's or ROH Women's World Championship. And the ring savvy Santana Garrett answers the call and chose to wrestle for the ROH World title. Um, this was fine, but you know how it went. Deanna Perazzo. Um, Deanna Perrazzo, she Oh, she didn't win with the arm bar. Um, yeah, just Deanna Perrazzo Pender. It was a little botched. It, I, I don't want to say it was botched. That's not the right term. It didn't come off the way it was supposed to. Yeah. I had to rewind it. Like, was that a three count? Right. So um, I love Santana Garrett. Mm-hmm. Uh, probably more than I should. I think she's like <laughs> top, top, top five hottest female wrestlers. Um, I know my brother, he's a casual wrestling fan, but he's always like, she is so hot. Um so I was happy it was her. I would imagine it was a one-off because she lives in the area. Right. And I think that's probably even the same case with Connor. He probably lives there because he used to live there with NXT. Okay. So that's probably why he was used. So I don't expect to see her back on TV again. I would like to see her. She's good. She's real good. I mean, she did a, a couple things this match. I was like, man, she's freaking amazing. You know, going back to the audio issues we said at the beginning, I mean, she comes out, you could hear a pin drop. I'm sure mm-hmm. they did react to her because they know her locally and she was in WWE, so they know her. But um, audio-wise, it sounded like a pin drop. So that's why that's why I said this at the, uh, at the end of the pandemic era when they started letting people in. I was like, yo, keep the piped-in crowd noise, man. Like, it doesn't have to be as loud as before. Just make it a background track, but have something, right. man, because yeah. that shit uh, – I mean, it just, it just came off like a fart in church, dude. And, yeah. Um, <laughs> But I enjoyed them. I enjoyed the match. Like they, they were, I knew, I mean, how can you have a bad match with the two of them? So that's true. Uh, Very true. Yeah, so. You got two people that could work. Um, all right. So team impact tells Scott Demore that they want ROH champion, Jonathan Gresham to be Josh Alexander's replacement at no surrender. But first they must focus on tag team action against honor. No more's Mike Bennett and Matt Taven tonight. Um, I think that was actually very interesting that they name dropped Jonathan Gresham. That tells me that he's going to play a part in the story going forward. And I think I kind of know what part he's going to play. All right. So, you know, all right, we let, had... me, let me rewind here real quick because it just hit me. When you said, you asked me, what does AEW get out of it with Josh Alexander? I don't even think it is something they get out of it, but you got to remember Josh Alexander was supposed to beat Kenny Omega once upon a time for the title to elevate him to where they needed to get him. So if that was the, if we assume that at least, I mean, cause Kenny had to lose to somebody. So we assume that was the plan. They just inserted Christian Cajun, obviously. So if AEW agreed, if Tony Khan agreed, okay, Kenny Omega is going to lose to this guy. Cause we understand <clears throat> we need that to happen to get your, your guy over. Then I can see where the, the agreement changes course a little bit and then said, Hey, we still, we still need some help with Josh here. 
So that's another reason I could see him show up there. Yeah. 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 I, listen, I don't think anything's off the table. One thing about AEW, they love a splash. They love uh, uh, a, a headline grabbing, a, a, a tweet, uh, a tweet headline grabbing uh, event. So um, I think something like that could get some tweets popping. And um, yeah, I think that could definitely, I think that could definitely be a thing. Yeah. Uh, so before Mickey James defends the knockouts world title against Tasha Steeles at no surrender, she battled Chelsea green in a, f- in friendly competition tonight. Speaking of Tasha, she joins Tom Hannafin and Matthew Raywald on commentary with Savannah Evans by her side. Green hit a baseball slide drop kick, but forces, but focuses her attention on Tasha at ringside, allowing James to take control. James attempts the, the Mick DDT, the Mick DT, uh, but Chelsea counters into Tasha's own finishing move, the cutter. Oh, God. Uh, Tasha leaves commentary to throw a trash bin at Chelsea Green, and then Evans attacks her to cause the disqualification. Um, yeah, so I thought this this match was going to be a bit, and this, this still feels like the setup for Chelsea Green going heel on Mickey James. Um, but I just, I, I can't pinpoint exactly where it's going to happen now. I thought this match was going to be the vehicle for that to happen, but Tasha Steele's got involved. Savannah Evans got involved and we're still leading to the, um, oh, 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 I think I figured it out. Ew. So, all right. Mickey James is going to beat Tasha Steele's at no surrender. Then she's going to give Chelsea Green one more friendly match. Chelsea Green's yeah. going to do her dirty to win the title. There you go. There you go. Boom. Be, you know, wrestling 101 if they do that. That'll be out the yeah. book. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, you know, we'll see. Um I, D-Lo called it the McDDT. And I'm like, what is this? Uh, uh number four on the uh right. <laughs> on the so with fries. He, he needs to change the name, retire the move, everything. That is the worst finisher in wrestling. But um so uh, first I want to say it is uh, such a breath of fresh air for me to not have an, a segment every single episode for like four years complaining about the commentary. You know, like all of a sudden now I'm just like, that doesn't even cross my mind. Like they do such a good job. I don't, I don't start the episode like, yo, let, let me tell you what the fuck Josh, Mal- Josh Matthews said this, you know, let, let me tell you about Matt Stryker this week, you know? Right. D-Lo Brown, oh my God, oh my goodness. You know, like, I don't do that anymore. So it's really cool. And I was very, very appreciative of this team because I was watching NWA this morning and I was catching up. And for two episodes, they had Austin Idol on commentary, who I, I have never been so annoyed by a, a, a person on my screen in any company as I am him. Mm-hmm. And, jo- and uh, I don't want to talk to Josh Alexander. Velvet Sky on commentary. I've mentioned this before. She sucks. I mean, she's so bad. And they put her and Austin Idol on color. Their their play by play is good, but that is so effing bad. Um, there was a there was a Matt Cardona came in and attacked uh, Trevor Murdoch at the end of the episode, and Velvet Sky's like, Matt, you get out of this ring right now. Leave the NWA right now, like a like a mother in the mall, man. Like get off the ground. You're right going to time out, Matt. Now. Yes. He goes, at one point, she goes, "Oh my God, this makes me so hot." I'm sorry for the choice words. I was like, "What?" Anyway, I was so appreciative of Impact's current commentary, man, because I had to put the show on mute. I was like, I can't do this anymore. Did you think you'd ever say that? No, no. Where I was just definitely not definitely effing not. So yeah, I, ha- I have to put them on mute, man. I, I can't anymore. That the commentary is so bad on that show. But anyway, uh, speaking of commentary and speaking of NWA. So Tasha Steeles was on commentary also. And the episode of NWA I was watching, Kira Hogan was doing a backstage interview. Um, you know, she is a part of AEW. They allow her to continue working with NWA, which she has said she's very thankful for because she's actually a part of storylines there and does shit. She cuts it, she does this interview backstage, man. 
baby face promo. Boring as shit. It was so bad. Um, Tasha, I mean, not Tasha, but Kiera became Kiera when she became a heel. Because when she was a baby face back in the days with Allie and all this, like, she was not good. That is not her role. Not even a little bit. Yeah. And um, when I was listening to her cut this baby face promo, it was like they took her back to square one, man. Mm -hmm. I mean, Kiera Hogan, who showed up in TNA like six years ago, back to square one. It was so bad. And um, I was just comparing her to Tasha Steeles now, man. I'm just like, Kiera probably should have never left. Yeah. You know? Uh I th- well, I mean, she got a couple of matches on AEW, and I think that, like, you know, I remember tweeting about this when it first happened, and and I, my tweet was something to the effect of, you know, you know, you walk out of out of the Impact Zone, and you know, a month later, you're wrestling in front of ten thousand people. You know, like I, I think you can't now. Obviously, they didn't have any long term plans for her, but um, that's an experience she was never going to have an Impact. You know yeah. what I mean? Like she was never gonna have that 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 experience as an Impact Wrestling performer. So you know, I don't know, man. And I think wrestlers deserve that, right? Like, um, you saw so many of those people, like, um, in the Royal Rumble, right? Like the people that were coming back to WWE for the first time in a long time. It probably just felt so amazing to be back in front of a crowd like that because WWE is the only place, and AEW has done really good. But for the most part, WWE is the only place where you get a crowd like that that size, that engaged in the product, that loud, you know, um, you just, yeah. it's just, it's just, it's, it's uncommon. And I feel like all the wrestlers deserve it, but it's just not something that happens a lot. Yeah. But just in her case, you know, and I met Kiera a couple months after she left impact and, you know, chatted with her a little bit. And you, I could hear in her voice, like, she wasn't sure what was next. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. no shit. Like, she's, she definitely bet on herself, maybe against her better judgment. Right. Uh, I don't know that it's worked out for her. I mean, maybe monetarily it has, but I don't, I don't think – she's even done an interview. She's like, I'm already lost in the shuffle over there. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. 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 So, Yeah. But you know, but, uh, best of luck to her. You know, we'll we'll, we'll see. I think that but, like also too, it can't hurt to go out and um, you know spread your wings, see what type of stuff you can learn. You know, working in front of uh, different types of audiences and in different locker rooms. Like I think you know, it can only make you better. And then you know, if you come back to somewhere you worked before, then you bring you know whatever you took away from all those different experiences you had. So um, yeah, yeah. Like, it, in NWA, she's had two matches with Mickey James and then one as her tag team partner. If she was an impact, she wouldn't be wrestling Mickey James. And it probably wouldn't be competitive if she was. Right, so, right. you know, she, she is picking up from it. Uh, but to go back to this match, Mickey James and Chelsea Green, which what really disappointed me here was, you know, very cookie cutter finish. Oh, I did like her throwing the trash in there, but they promoted this match as one of the headline matches of the show. Yeah. When you know when they were trying to convince people on social media buy tickets for this event, like that mm-hmm. was one of the matches they were like, "Yo, we got Chelsea Green versus Mickey James." Great point. And then it's a BS match. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's the it's yeah. for this episode of Impact on YouTube. That's the thumbnail for it. Right. You no. Know? Right. Right. It's nothing. Yeah. And I think even if you're gonna do a schmoz like that, like let them have a good match and then do the schmoz. You know right. what I mean? Like, let them go out there and have 10 minutes, you know, 10 minutes, you know, 12 minutes and and uh, and 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 make us feel like there's more that we want to see here if the bad guy doesn't interfere. But they didn't right. do that. You know, um, you're, you're right, though, like give the fans something to appreciate. And by the way, I think doing stuff like that would be a great way to get more out of your out of out of your talent. You know what I mean? Like, so let's say you uh you know let's well i don't know the average the average episode of impact probably has what five matches on it right so right it's, like it's, it's usually about six now like for a while it was four and then it right. started getting about five and I, I think they've actually had several that have been six but this was a real promo heavy episode so i don't know well that's kind of what i was going to say is like you know what if you were to pack your show with 
uh, like the actual time fans are in the building with six bust ass 20 minute matches. You know what I mean? Like, and, and the fans are just, the fans just leave exhausted and, um, and have totally enjoyed themselves. <coughs> and now you got, <coughs> excuse me, two weeks of television where you haven't burnt out your, you know, burnt out, burnt your audience out on the talent, right? Like, like, so, so I'm saying like you get Mickey James and Chelsea Green out there. They have a bust ass 20 minute match with an ending that makes us want to see what's next. But also now you don't have to wear the audience out on seeing them. You know what I mean? Like you've, you've, you've totally increased their value. Uh, and again, I'm just thinking of like, I remember when I went to impact tapings in, um, Oh man, it was, um, I think the Manhattan center or the, the ballroom or whatever, uh, one of those places. And, um, and it was cool, man. It was a lot of fun, but they taped two episodes of impact. And by the end of it, I was done, bro. I was just done. It's like, you can't ask me to cheer loudly and be a great fan for four hours. That's not fair. You know what I mean? Like, that's not fair. That's not, that's not fair to ask me to make your product good for four hours. You got to do better than that. You know what I mean? Um, and I think again, like the way you can mitigate that is by giving me, you know, again, like I said, even if it's like just, just six matches that are just bust ass and then, you know, some promos that are also bust ass, but like make everything longer. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, like, so, 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 so the amount of content you would put in one episode, put it over two episodes, but just, just, just give us more time to absorb everything. Like, I don't know, maybe, maybe in practice, that doesn't sound, that doesn't come off as good as it does in theory, but, um, but, but I don't know, man. I don't know. I, I think that's, that's one way you could like really just kind of, I don't know, like just stretch out the product that you have to get more value from it. I, I think they they toy. I don't think they know their formula yet. That's not yeah. a knock on them. That's not. Please don't hear me wrong when I say that. I just mean I think they've for years been toying. What is the best way to get through these tapings? Yeah. Um, I'm sure they're very <clears throat> excuse me very aware that the crowd energy lessens. I mean I'm sure right. that they're fully aware of that. Right. So I would imagine over the years that they're, you know, even set to set of tapings, they're like, okay, let's try this, let's this. I, they have to. Um, they probably just don't know what that formula is quite yet. Right. But, right. you know, maybe the day will come where they're like, you know, it, something clicks for them and this is how we have to deliver the show. Because what we need is we need the energy to maintain. Mm. But at the same time, we don't want to take away from, uh, you know, we'll get to this here in a bit. Steve Macklin ran out to save the Impact guys. That live crowd didn't know what the fuck Steve Macklin was running out there for. Because right. they don't know the backstage. So they have no clue creatively what's going on. So right. you, they have to find, they, they got to find a way to balance. I get that they, they book all the matches and do everything backstage because they don't want shit to get spoiled. And that makes right. sense because, you know, weeks ago I was saying, I, I criticized them because they called Morrissey versus... I think maybe Cardona a special stipulation match. And I'm like, what's the stipulation? The people don't know what it is, but then I realize, okay, it's because they don't want the spoilers to get out, whatever. I get it, but they got to find some kind of balance. It's like, we're going to keep that energy going. We're going to deliver good matches, mm -hmm. but the people in the arena cannot be in the dark at the same time. Right. Creatively. So. And exactly. If you go to a WWE show, like the, the, in the in house uh or the the in arena experience is basically watching it on television right like because they you, you're seeing all the segments as they air on television like the backstage pre-tapes they're all done up they're pre-tapes right so they're all done ahead of time but they're rolling and like you're seeing them as they're airing it's not like you know it's not like we're just sitting in the dark and they're rolling something backstage like no all of that stuff airs on the big jumbotron so we get to come out and react to it and um and again i think that's one thing impact could definitely stand to do if you're going to tell the story that way you know what i mean like you said i think it makes sense you just gave the perfect example like steve macklin ran out to uh to further something that happens earlier in the episode that the live audience had no idea happened you know like that's just you know that's just that's just not good business 
Um, so whatever you got to do, man, like have people get there a day early, you know, whatever to get your pre-tapes done. But, um, but yeah, you just got to find a way to get that stuff done just to make it more, make it again. I think that like, they need to make their philosophy focus on the live experience. I think if impact focuses on the live experience, I think everything else will flow from there. Make yeah. sure that people are going to your show, having an amazing time that they want to tell people about and rave about on the way home. I think that's the number one thing impact can do and should do to um, just start increasing their product all around. You know what I mean? Like make sure people go home tweeting and, and, and live posting about the time they just had at an impact show. Like, I feel like that should be the company focus until further notice. You know what I mean? Like just yeah. get the, you know, get out there and get this live event money. So, and if you just tape it, then you again, all you're doing is promoting the live events, which is, you know, going to further the cycle, keep more people coming and spending money. All right. So Gia Miller interviewed Bupinder Gujar following his triumphant impact debut over John Schuyler last week. Gujar says that after winning championships in bodybuilding, boxing, and kickboxing, he left India to pursue his dream of becoming a professional wrestler. Raj Singh approaches him, but just like last week, Gujar walks away. Madison Rain catches up with Kayla with a K, taking photos of the Knockouts World Tag Team Champions, the inspiration. She was not happy with him. Okay, not happy. Um, the Bullet Club comes to the ring to address their upcoming matchups at No Surrender. For the first time ever, the Gorillas of Destiny challenge the Good Brothers for the Impact World Tag Team titles. Plus, the Bullet Club's leader goes one-on-one -on -one with Violent by Design's Eric Young. Jay White questions the integrity of the alliance between Violent by Design and the Good Brothers, prompting an interruption from Violent by Design. Eric Young tells the Bullet Club that unlike Violent by Design, they're hanging on to something that was cool 10 years ago. Young challenges them to a six-man tag team match next week. Then the Good Brothers come out and take credit for the Bullet Club's success. Carl Anderson says the Good Brothers have been everywhere, but Tama Tonga fires back and says that's only because they've been fired from everywhere. The Gorillas of Destiny claim that when they become the new Impact World Tag Team Champions at No Surrender, they'll fire the Gun Good Brothers from the Bullet Club for good. This was actually a fun promo. I enjoyed it. Um, it's nice to see fresh energy come on the mic in front of that Impact Wrestling crowd. Yeah, um, oh yeah. I remember the first time we saw Jay White cut a promo in an Impact ring, and it stood out. It stood out like a sore thumb because nobody in Impact cuts a promo like that. And uh, it just it was it was just it was good to see. And I'm certainly looking forward to uh, the Good Brothers versus Gorillas of Destiny because I just want somebody, anybody to take those title off of the Good Brothers. Anybody, anybody. You know, I got to take back something I said months ago. I criticized Impact for not doing the Good Brothers versus the Bullet Club months ago. This was, I don't know, might have been Bound for Glory when they were they did a three-way match. Or I think they did a four-way match for the belts at one point. And I really, really criticized them. I was like, are you seriously not going to do Bullet Club versus the Good Brothers? And now we look at this, and it's like, okay, well, this that that group, that version of the Bullet Club, I don't want to call it the watered-down version of it, but that was not the A-team of the Bullet Club. You know, Hikaleo and uh, El Fantasmo, and then the new edition of Chris Bay. So now I get it. Okay, the, they they weren't going to do two on two, the Bullet Club versus the Good Brothers back then because it wasn't. It was marquee in name, but not in in talent. Um, now it's like okay, now this is this is different. Now you got the Gorillas of Destiny. They don't want to waste Bullet Club versus Good Brothers two on two on you know Hikaleo and Phantasmal. So makes a lot of sense. I get it. Uh, but this was this was. Um, this was really good mic work. I, I I popped at home when Eric Young said you're, you know, something that was cool ten years ago that you didn't even make up. You Me know? too. Me too. I thought that was it was excellent. Uh, I think the Good Brothers music is horrible. It is way too slow. Like there, it's we talk a lot about you know someone's music hitting and you, 
and there being some energy and you pop for that person and you can't with the good brothers man they just they stroll out there and it's going to be christmas by the time they get to the ring and it's <laughs> it takes forever man um but this was all very good that this was yeah. this was this was cool let's talk a little bit though about jay white appeared in AEW, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden it's like there we effing go you know the bullet club is not i don't want to say uh specific to impact because they're not but it just seemed like okay impact's doing bullet club stuff here in the states awesome oh and by the way them talking about what were you the club the you know yeah. saying how many times they tried to restart the, oh, that show yeah. was so good man god yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. um but you know aw now they got to get the bullet club involved but we know where that storyline's going i know it's not an aw podcast they're bringing they got the three stables that Adam Cole is a part of, and now he's going to have to eventually <laughs> choose who to go. It's like a love oh. triangle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's exactly what they're doing, which I actually – actually is kind of cool. But um, Impact's going to hurt for that because now it's not the show where you can specifically catch Jay White in the United States. Gorilla is a destiny. He's probably going to show up on there too. Um, so that kind of sucks. Uh, a lot of people are really upset uh, upset about this on social media. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I was watching the episode because remember Tony Khan got me to tune in, and when Jay White showed up, I'm like, oh my god! And then Jay White actually cut a promo on this uh, Rampage episode, I guess, you know, here, and um, I was like, man, he's he's gonna be a little fixture here. And now that he's he's wrestling against Trent Beretta, I think the day before, no surrender. So it's just like. It's like they're almost beating impacts of the punch. Uh, yeah. For, you know, hmm. Getting a hmm. one-on-one match. So it's. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, I think it's kind of dirty. And I think that, um, uh, yeah, you know, I think, I think it's, it's really, honestly, Tony Khan doesn't owe impact anything, but that's kind of trash, dog. That's kind of trash. You know what I mean? Because just like you said, like the, like impact is advertising an appearance by Jay White on a certain day. You're going to put him on TV and wrestle the day before that. That is trash, dog. Yeah. That's trash. Like, why would you do that? Why would you cut out their legs? And again, you know they need it. You know what I mean? Like, you know they need it. Uh, you know, they need something to be an attraction. And so, um, again, by putting him on national TV wrestling the day before uh, his impact appearance, you're you're killing the urgency of anyone seeing him because they're going to have seen him in a big environment with a live crowd the day before. And, um, you know, now look, the other, the other way that could work is maybe he could do something so hot that it drives more people to come see him at the the live show. But I doubt it, you know, I don't know. I I doubt it. But, um, but I just think from Tony Khan's standpoint, I don't know that that, I think that's a little, that's a little trash. That's a little trash. Yeah, dude, Tony Tony does low shit like that, man. He, he really does. He plays dumb. Uh, people eat up everything he says, and he's he's a good promoter, man. Like he knows how to get the word out about shit. He knows how to drive interest uh, to create buzz. He he knows what he's doing. But you know, I, I brought this. Um, <clears throat> I used this example months ago when I was I was doing music and I was part of a group, and I always noticed the main dude in the group anytime someone did something on social media that people got excited about the the main dude he had to like hey you know what check this new song like he he did something to always upstage um <laughs> each one of us you know every, yeah. every time uh and that i get that from tony con man he he mm. finds con man he finds a way to upstage other people uh especially the, even the ones he's partnered with he, he just does every time it's there's a pattern. It's not just that, a yeah, coincidence. That, that's it's a that's very like you said. It's it's very true to how he's behaved. You know what I mean? Like he just he has to grab the spotlight. So, um, you know, it's a uh, true to form. All right. So, um, let's see. ROH World Champion Jonathan Gresham has been attacked backstage. We see him laying uh, down on the floor. But again, a typical wrestling trope is we see the guy laying, but we don't see who attacked him. So the mystery is of who attacked him, and then there's a red herring of who you think attacked him, when in reality, nobody probably attacked him. All right, 
Um, digital media champion Matt Cardona explains his actions when he used a steel chair to defeat Jordan Grace last week. Cardona says that he had to do things different in 2022 after he was screwed out of the Impact World title at Hard to Kill and Impact Management didn't offer him a rematch. Cardona reveals that Grace will receive her rematch at no surrender and begs for her to be ready. <clears throat> this, was, this was pretty good by Cardona, man. Mm-hmm. When she said, you know, the digital media's like, she goes, the digital media championship, he's like, the Dig- digital media world championship. Yeah. So we got some good heel Cardona stuff coming, man. I think I, so. I, this is just like the beginning. He's just scratching the surface. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So uh, we got uh, Maria Canellis joining Tom Hannafin and Matthew Raywalt on commentary as we get a preview of things to come in the Honor No More versus Team Impact Showdown at No Surrender. As tensions rise between the two groups at ringside, the referee sent all nine competitors to the back, leaving uh, Matt Taven and Mike Bennett in the ring against Rich Swan and uh rhino yeah rich swan and rhino um all right and let's see so taven hit swan with a sliding drop kick off the distraction longtime owner and current ambassador of roh carrie silken is seen watching from ringside swan attempts to fight out of the corner but gets caught with a death valley driver from bennett taven hits him with the running boot for two swan finally takes them out with one enziguri after another, Swan makes the tag to Rhino, who goes on the attack. Bennett distracts the referee, allowing Canellas to throw powder in the eyes of Rhino. Taven capitalizes with the climax to win. After the match, Taven put his hands on Silken when Steve Macklin makes the save. Macklin takes out Taven as Rhino hits Bennett with the gore. Uh, um... There's a little more to this. On the other side of the curtain backstage, uh, Ian Riccoboni tells Eddie Edwards that he's known Steve Macklin for years and he can be trusted as a member of Team Impact. Edwards, Saban, Rhino, and Swan reluctantly welcome to the team. This has Swerve written all over it. Uh, all over it. And right. I don't know what it is. Uh, I think they... First of all, I kind of miss Marie Can- Canellis on impact man when she got into the booth and started talking i was like man i, I kind of miss those days where she would talk like this because i'm the first lady so <laughs> uh but it's annoying it's good heel annoying though right she went mr fuji i was like oh wow man P- toss the pow- powder this has swerve written all over it i don't know what it is man um you know what's funny rick ian rick and bonnie's in one of the wrestling groups i'm in in facebook and he just participates uh-huh. in there like a random ass what well, like we That's would you know i don't right. remember what group it is but every once in a while he's just in there commenting like a, a wrestling fan it's just it's always funny um but you've got re in rick in rick and and the dude who owns it and you know um man it, you have macklin show up and it's like did he take out gresham did he not did he is, is it is a part of a baby face turn is he gonna screw tim and him in back is he going to be managed by this dude who runs ROH, you know, who they, they had a little moment? Is R- Rick Abani going to turn heel and they're going to, yeah, I mean, that, that's tinfoil hat right there. But um, I'm just saying there's so many directions this could go where the the Ring of Honor owner and, and, and Ian Rick Abani and stuff, they are, um, they want the ring, the ring of Honor guys to get jobs there, Honor No More. You know, so maybe they're they're because you can see a scenario where this match has the ring announcer. It's got the commentary. Uh, I mean, the, the play by play guy. It's got the owner all ringside and they and something right. happens. I don't know what they're going to do, but there's potential here for something super effing interesting. Right, right. Like, <clears throat> again, like it just uh it it just like uh it feels like you know you got the impact guys trusting the roh guys who are gonna you know just who just feel like they're setting them up you know what i mean just feel like they're just there's like a total setup coming and the dumb baby faces are gonna walk right into it 
Right, and they're going to win. I don't know more is going to win. Like, we know they're going to win. So how are they going to get there? You know, right. and then there's also the Eddie Edwards wrinkle where people think he's turning heel. I, I don't think that's going to happen at this point. Yeah. So, but there's um, just a lot of things yeah. I can do. Yeah, you know, I, I I don't know if there's any juice in an Eddie turn right now. I think, like, um, I think, you know, what could be kind of cool is just finding a way to keep this – this this impact versus ROH thing kind of going, but in an interesting way. You know what I mean? Because these things feel so tired. They feel so cliche. So do something where there's like some sort of crazy major swerve, but it actually keeps me coming back next time to see what's going to happen. You know what I mean? Because I, yeah. I feel like I'm already ready to be done with this uh, in the sense of like, all right, we know that these guys are signing to impact or have signed to impact. And so, like, to to give me a whole stipulation on if they win, they stay. If they lose, they leave. Well, we know you just gave away the damn the the damn house right there. We know what it is. <laughs> right. So, um, so you know, how can you continue to make this interesting? I think is the question. And um, you know, how do you answer that? You know what I mean? Like, so this I'm, is what I think was initially going to happen because we know that Willie Mac and um. Heath, I believe due to COVID protocols, weren't at the taping. So that's why they were randomly replaced by Chris Saban and, and Josh Alexander. Josh Alexander very quickly was taken out of the match, which I think was convenient. They had, you know, it was a convenient storyline where, hey, you're off Team Impact, uh, which, you know, that had nothing to do with the, the overall arc of the story with Josh Alexander. Like he's trying to go be world title, you know, the world champion. But very quickly, you know, they were able to throw them in there. Hey, by the way, you're off Team Impact. You know, like, right. I think it was just convenient that that all fell together. I yeah. think uh, I think what the story was, was Heath was going to get attacked backstage, like the way that Jonathan Gresham did. Um, but they just moved players, or they just moved the players around, the pieces around a little bit. So I think they were going to do, and that's cookie cutter as shit, but I think they were going to take Heath out and then uh, – you know, replace them with Macklin or whatever they were going to do. But I think what we're seeing on TV is a version of the, of the way the story was supposed to go initially. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, but um, it, I, it, it just has a potential to be really interesting. Yeah. I hope they don't just do some cookie cutter shit. Like this is, yeah, this man. Is like, real you, you got it. You might as well make it good. You know what I mean? You might yeah. as well make it good. Um, all right, so backstage we got Gia Miller interview with Giselle Shaw, and we found out that she's going to be taking on Lady Frost in her debut next week. That sucks for Lady Frost. You're not beating this girl in her debut, so yeah, yeah. I was like, what the hell? Why can't she just wrestle? Yeah, you know, um, tips, you know, whatever. But so. it is what it is. Let's 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 see how it goes. Let it play out. That's what the nerds always like to say. Let it play yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we have Brian booking. Myers with the Learning Tree. Uh, versus W. Morrissey in a no disqualification match. W. Morrissey looks to unleash his pent up rage on Brian Myers and the Learning Tree in no disqualification match. VSK and Zicky Dice jump on Morrissey on his way to the ring, and it's all legal. Morrissey quickly takes them out as he gets caught with a roster cut clothesline. Moments later, uh, Myers calls for the tables, but it ends up costing him as Morrissey sends both. Dice and VSK crashing through them. The odds are now even with both members of the learning tree out of the equation. Myers hits a side Russian leg sweep. We talked about this on the uh, on the unprotected ramp to gain control. See a devastating move. Myers <laughs> duct tapes Morrissey to the ropes and assaults him with a kendo stick. Myers introduces a trash can into the match as he goes coast to coast for a very close near fall. Morrissey is free encounters the roster cut into a thunderous clothesline of his own. Morsey delivers not one, but two BQEs into a pile of thumbtacks to score the victory. Um, this was very good. I enjoyed this. Oh, by the way, after the match, Moose blindsided uh, W. Morrissey and whooped his ass pretty good. Uh, he put a chair around his neck and smashed him into the ring post and then smashed him with another chair while the chair was around his neck. And uh, yeah, Morrissey was left laying lights. So he was doing this thing where his 
he looked like he was having like a seizure, like his eyes were rolling, and he was just yeah, like, yeah. I was He's like, oh, this is weird. Why are you doing this? <laughs> so, tell us he was supposed to be fake Undertaker. <laughs> this fool was standing in the corner holding the chair up, like, hit me. Yeah. Hit the choker and Batman hit me. I mean, <laughs> he's just standing there holding it. I was just like, oh my God, this is painful. One thing about this main event that really stood out to me, though, that I have to say, you got to give these guys credit. W. Morrissey and Brian Myers are two guys that were WWE cast-offs, and they're here in Impact having a good main event. This was yeah. a good match, a good main event. These are two guys, Brian Myers especially, who never got a chance to do a damn thing in WWE. And you give somebody a shot, and they're capitalizing, and that's all you can ask. So I just want to give those guys their flowers, man. This was a great um, a, a great match. I really enjoyed it. And I thought they, 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 they've done a tremendous job you know, again, it's not like WWE did them any favors other than paying them, but um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, like, just you know, this this is proof of you know finding somebody, giving them time to develop, and giving them a shot to go out and do their thing, and they're both killing it. So shout out to both those guys. Yeah, uh, this was a good match. I didn't care initially because I I really dislike this version of the learning tree. I've been I've been saying that for a while. They went from very fun to me to just kind of a waste of my time. And I like Brian Myers a lot, but I don't, I just don't like the direction he's going right now. It's learning true is always comedy, but Sam Beal made it work and now they don't have him. And now it's like forced comedy. And yeah, um, I don't find Zicky Dice particularly funny. And I know he's a, he's a comedy wrestler. Yeah. So, uh, I just I just don't like them at all. I don't I don't enjoy their segments. But with that being said, it was pretty good. And I think Brian Myers did a very good job in uh how can I word this? It, it's clear at this point that Morrissey's a baby face. We we did we, it was very it was on some tweener shit before because he was just wrestling a bunch of jobbers. This was his first match legitimately versus someone in a while. And, you know, it's someone who's a clear-cut heel. And I think they did a good job telling the story that Morrissey's a babyface now. Like, I think they try to avoid it, but they can't. Um, you know, and they do a good job. Moose just comes out for this shit. He doesn't, they don't overexpose him, have him wrestle every single week like, you know, some co some companies would. In fact, it's good about the that. World though. champion. You should feel like it's something special when you see the world champion. And I think they're doing a good job of that with Moose. They're not overexposing him. Like Eddie yeah. Edwards was the I'm going to fight everybody every week champion. And I was like, this is terrible. You don't do yeah, this. Yeah, that was bad. Because <laughs> it ain't like they're going to promote your matches. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, ladies and gentlemen, this was a really good episode of Impact this week. Drop your comments below and tell us what you think about this episode, what you thought about what we had to say. Speaking of dropping your comments, we are now going to go back to the comment section for the first time in a long time because we got a few minutes uh we are burning the midnight oil for you here but we are going to eke it out we're going to hulk up and we're going to deliver a comments section a real quick you know maybe 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 five questions real quick from the comment section and uh just see you know what you guys have had to say to us over the last couple episodes so bq you ready to uh d dive into the comment section here let's do it so real quick, everybody, when you drop your comments on us uh, in, in, in the, the comments of the YouTube uh, videos, uh, make sure to leave your name and where you're from so that we can give you a shout out when you drop your comments. So uh, let's see. Bland Skies 20 says, they need to start creating more main event stars. Currently, it's just Moose, Morrissey, and Josh. That is clearly not enough. And they haven't brought in a single big name since Brian Cage back in 2018 for the main event scene. Uh, Bland Skies 20, thank you for the comment. I'm going to completely disagree with you. Um, I think Moose, Morrissey, and Josh Alexander is plenty right now. I mean, like, yeah, you know, that that's three separate people that you have good stories being built around. You know what I mean? Like it's it's hard to build. You can't build everybody. 
you can't build everybody, but I think you can, I think you can build more people. I think you can definitely have, you know, three, four, five people all being built strongly at the same time. But as far as like the main event scene, that is the main event scene. And I think a three person main event scene is, is plenty right now. So, um, and also you said they haven't brought in a single big name since Brian Cage. Brian Cage was not a big name when they brought him in. And, you know, it's debatable if he's a big name now. So that is what it is. Uh, you know, I, I kind of disagree to an extent too, because I know we've talked about the, the thin main event scene for a while, but that's when it was like Sammy Callahan and Eddie Edwards every other week in one way, shape or form. Like one of them was always involved. A lot of the times, both of them were involved, you know, we're talking Josh Alexander and Morrissey. Like those guys weren't involved in the main event scene for the longest time. They weren't, they weren't at all. You know, Moose wasn't even Moose. Moose would kind of like come and go, but sometimes he would have, he would have upper mid card, you know, feuds, but it was basically like Eddie Edwards, Sammy Callahan, Tommy Dreamer, you know, Tommy Dreamer. I, I bet if you counted, uh, you know, 2020, 2021, I bet he was in more, main event single main events than anyone on the roster right you know so um no i i think that i think there is improvement quite a bit on the main event scene you can plug in anytime you want eric young or rich swan in there uh obviously you gotta build them up a little bit but they have some dudes they can plug in if necessary they gotta like you know break glass in case of emergency they, they got they got some dudes and cardona is gonna be there very soon yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely uh, interested and excited for what's to come for Matt Cardona. Um, all right, let's see what we got here. AK Infinity says, "Great show as usual. Impact Management is probably watching y'all weekly. Wouldn't be a surprise." Uh, AK Infinity, I completely agree. I completely agree. I mean, like, um, first of all, like. We're, we're, we're giving it to you straight, no chaser. Okay. Like, uh, you don't have to like it, but it's real. You know what I mean? Like you, you don't have to like it, but it's true. You know, like, uh, I'm here for the truth. You know, it doesn't matter. Like, uh, you know, I, I, when it comes to, you know, talking about, uh, anything, um, you know, doing this type of, you know, media, if you want to call it that, um, like I'm a firm believer in the, uh, the Charlemagne principle, which is, you can't control the way people are going to react to what you say. You know what I mean? Like you can't control the way people are going to react to what you do. So it doesn't make sense to temper what you want to say or do because of how you think somebody else might react. You know what I mean? Say what you feel and just be ready to deal with the consequences. You know what I mean? Like, so impact doesn't have to ever like our show. They don't ever have to, you know, like send us guests or, or give us shout outs or anything like that. But you can see, you can see that the stuff that we're talking about here on this platform is having an effect on the on-screen product. BQ, is that fair? I think that I think that is fair. I don't think. And, yeah, go ahead. I, I don't. I don't think even if we, even if we put out something that went freaking viral and they came across it and changed it, I don't think we would ever get that acknowledgement. You know. Yeah. You, you don't gotta get it. You, you know you don't have to give us credit because we we know. And listen, the people if you're watching, if you're paying attention, you can see it. You know, and it's fine. Like again, like um, unless they're gonna cut us a check, like who cares? Who cares? Like you know what yeah. I mean? We're here for you. We're here for you. We're here for the people, for the listener, because we are you. We are fans. We're people who enjoy the product. And again, you know, like you know, one thing that BQ and myself have in common is that we both kind of got into this because we wanted to cover impact from um from a, a fan's perspective who didn't have an axe to grind you know what i mean and it didn't it, like so much of the the internet wrestling critic you know just views impact as like the 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 whipping post you know and we're just the you know impact is the thing you kick and insult to make yourself feel better and i think that when you listen to wrestling podcast and stuff like that you do it to help feed your fandom. You want to enjoy it. You know what I mean? Like you want to actually talk about the storylines and the characters that are actually happening on the show, not just talk down your nose about a product as if, you know, it's the dirty kid in the classroom. Um, and so, so yeah, man, like, and, and, and that's what we deliver. And, and it doesn't mean, 
it doesn't mean trying to tell you everything is all cherries and roses because nine times out of 10, it isn't. Um, but, you know, I think it's, I think, you know, we talk about the product from an objective standpoint, um, objective, but also people who want to see the product be better, mm-hmm. you know? And so, um, so yeah, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm happy with the work we do. You know, I'm happy with the work we do. Um, I, it's fun. I enjoy doing it and I'm glad you guys enjoy listening to it. All right, let's see what else we got here. <clears throat> so S- Cider Cider Blurry 28 says, Impact was in bigger venues because they were on Spike TV, a network which way more people have. So it's much easier for them to go to bigger places when fans watch them on basic cable. Impact can be prompting, promoting as much as they want but if people don't have access TV, it doesn't really matter. Uh, thank you for your comment, Slider Blurry 28. Um, I don't necessarily agree because I, I said it before I'll say it again. If Monday Night Raw went to access TV, it would still do 2 million viewers. Okay. Like they would still find, find a way. People would find a way to find the shows. Again, what, did, what, what, what did it, they did like 800,000 people on Twitch the first day Kenny Omega was going to be on there. If you, if people want to find the show, they can and will find the show. Okay. Like does access TV have the most homes of any, of any network? No, they're not on the basic package. No, that's totally true. But the biggest, I think it's a diversion to focus on that stuff. Focus on impact, right? Like impact needs to make their product hot. They need to make it fun. You know, like a lot of people make fun of like the, um, the, the, the clear shift in um in direction that wwe made with nxt 2.0 but you know what it's working you know what i mean like it's working it doesn't look like the previous nxt at all you know it looks totally different the um the presentation is different the actual in-show production is different the the characters they're producing are different and um and and people may have flinched at the original, you know why people flinched? And I'm gonna say this, this is another, and it's funny because it's actually kind of timely. People loved this version of, the old version of NXT because it was WWE's version of ROH. So it kind of, it kind of makes sense and it flows logically that the WWE version of ROH died at the same time as the real version of ROH died. Yeah. <laughs> Again, I'm here for the truth, people. I'm here for the you truth. Know, and I'm going to say this too. I get where he's going with that. But there's independent shows who have no problem packing 600, six, 700 people. I talk about Glory Pro here locally. Uh, they'll, I've been to their shows. They'll, they'll pack a good six, 700. Tried and True Pro, which they got a, they're hosting a NWA tonight, their, their event. They're in, um, used to operate strictly out of Tennessee. Now they move around a little bit. I've been to tried and true pro uh, easy thousand people in there. I mean, one of the, by far the biggest crowd I've seen for a, a independent show that I've been to. Right. Um, e- easy thousand people. Right. You know, so, and that's not television product. Right. So it, it's a matter of, uh, you know, GCW, we know they have huge crowds. So it's a matter of just right. making, making a hot product. Right. Um, you know, GCW has a niche audience. Right. Uh, but to an extent, you need to have some kind of niche audience. And that's where I've, you know, I've yeah. talked about this before, like that. Impact, Impact doesn't have an identity. They don't have an identity. They don't have that identity <clears throat> where it's like, hey, we're going to see this kind of wrestling there. Now, granted, that being said, when it comes to like ring psychology and selling and all that stuff, like they're the one company that they do it. They got that down. As much as people say they want to see that, the, the proof isn't there that they want to see that because AEW has none of that and people eat it up. So I think it's one of those things people complain about and then they get it and it's like, oh, it's not that big of a deal. But that is something Impact is excellent with. They're not, they don't have people no sell. And, uh, Santana Garrett no sold a kick today or something. Yeah. Or, or not today, but on this episode. <clears throat> And I was thinking, man, that's the first time I've seen that on Impact in a while, just like a blatant no sell, and then they yeah. turn around and hit a move. You know, that's not what they do, but yeah, they yeah. do got to find a way to find their 
their space because there's yeah, new yeah. wrestling companies who come in and find their space. Absolutely. You know what totally I mean? Agree. We've seen since Impact Inception, we've seen ROH, we've seen Lucha Underground come, we've seen AEW come in, see NWA come in, and they find their 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 space. You know yep. what I mean? And Impact's still. Uh, Impact's like we're here too. That's their yeah. niche. We're yeah. here too. Um, but I but I want to say this. I want to say this, and I want to say this to uh. Uh, cool Factor Nation that's out there, the Cool Factor faithful who are <laughs> listening to this show. Um, I challenge Impact Wrestling to clearly define your brand, clearly define your mission statement, clearly define, you know, who your product is, you know, who your product is for and, 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 and stay true to that. You know what I mean? Like I said, if it was me, I would I would go after the motto of we're the best value in live entertainment. And I would make it all about like I would make our mission principle to send people home happy and satisfied and willing to come back and give us their money next time. That's what I would do if it was me. But <clears throat> for the people in charge of impact, like define what your mission is. Okay. Like is your mission to is your mission to um, to, 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 to push the business forward for, on a digital platform, you know, is your mission to serve wrestling fans anytime, anywhere is your mission to, you know, whatever, right? Like do some think tanks, right? Like define who you are because the truth is impact wrestling TNA has been a mishmash. And BQ just said it. I'm not going to re-say the same thing he just said. But like for the longest time, Impact has kind of just been there. And they've been trying to get in where they fit in. That's why they have this X Division, right? This X Division, which we know what it was supposed to be when it came about. And it's still trying to be that same thing today. But it really doesn't necessarily have the same niche today because almost everybody who's a headliner wrestles that style. So it doesn't make sense, right, as a niche style. But it's a it's a it's 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 our thing, it's TNA's thing. So we're gonna hold on to it, right? <clears throat> so I challenge Impact Wrestling to define yourself, like define yourself, define who you are, define what is your niche, who's the fan you're going after, define it for all of us. So, you know, we 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 brought up our our sports teams before our basketball teams. You're a Laker fan. I'm a Clipper fan. So. The Clippers for a very long time, very bad franchise. Um, I, I've endured a lot of losing where, you know, we played the Lakers on TV a week and a half ago. Um, it was our home game. You know, I know from people in the arena that we at best had a 40%. It was at best a 60-40 split, us being the 40. You know what I mean? It's a Laker town. There's no way around that. Uh but, you know, Steve Ballmer bought the team. He came in and has helped them establish an identity to where there is a fan base there. It's not the Laker fan base. It never will be. But there is a fan base there. There is enough to be a large enough fan base to sell out the arena on good games and uh, to be relevant, you know. And we have a, a new arena that we got opening up in a year and a half from now, the Intuit Dome. Steve Ballmer has hired a team. This so the Intuit Dome, they've they've already have been saying the rumblings are it will be the best arena in in sports in all of sports, not just the NWA. I mean NWA. I'm sorry, not just the NBA. All of sports. And um, what Steve Ballmer has done, he's hired a team that has gone into is going into every arena across the country, football, basketball, college, and he is they are finding the best part of every single arena and putting that into the uh the intuit dome it's going to have the most leg room of any arena in sports you know um they, as a matter of fact the concession stands you're going to order from your phone you you're not going you do not have to get up and get in line to get concessions i mean there's there's a lot that they're doing my point is it's it's kind of talking about uh what TW said about increasing the live experience, you know, they're just going to, they're, they, they know they're, they're playing from behind when it comes to the LA fans. So they're, they are, you know, we're going to create a live experience unlike any other 
sport, any other team you go to, you can only get that experience coming here. You know what I mean? Um, and that, that's kind of how they're approaching being the other team in Los Angeles. So that's kind of what I'm saying. What I'm saying is I'm, I'm what TW says is right. It, maybe that's your, your niche of finding a way to make that live experience unlike anything else. That doesn't mean you go to single every wrestling arena and grab what's best. I'm just I'm just giving you an example of what uh, one of the most successful men in America in America from a marketing standpoint has approached how we're gonna you know, how we're gonna get you know people in our arena. So that's something that they got to do, and and it's gonna be tough because people have a blast at AEW shows, uh, people have a blast at the NWA shows. You know that they they have found ways to make the live experience really good, and Impact not so much. You know they between matches they play we own the night between every single match. Big <laughs> shocker right there, right? You know, um, I mean when I when I used to go to the in Orlando, like there was there was nothing special about being there. You know, <clears throat> you got you got to find a way to make that live experience a blast. That's right. <clears throat> That's right. So again, the challenge for Impact Wrestling, define yourself. Define yourself for us. You know what I mean? Help us help you. All right, we'll take a couple more. Okay, we'll take, we'll take two more, two more, two more coming up. All right, so next question is, <clears throat> let's see. Carter Inc. says, I don't see why Impact doesn't relaunch Explosion as a legit second show. Either as a one-hour show on Access or YouTube, Explosion in its own original run was like a weekly magazine roundup style show, primarily for international distribution, like here in the UK. Relaunch it as a second show to give more spotlight to the mid and lower level talents and showcase the digital media title more. Also, the X Division title on occasions, it would serve as a better format than BTI. Um, so Carter Inc., thanks for the question. I'm gonna say, I don't know, man. Like, you know, I don't know. I think Explosion ran its course. I don't think we're missing anything by not having Explosion. And I said it before, I'll say it again. I think that, you know, I think the impact should really just try it, man. Like dip your toe in the water and do a one hour knockout show, do a one hour knockout show, you know, let them fly and create some good positive buzz. I think that what do you have to lose? Like, why not? You know what I mean? Why not? You know, like, again, um, I, I said it all the time that I think that impact um, their knockouts division has always been very character driven. And I think it has an opportunity to be very wrestling driven and I think it'd be good. I think people would enjoy it. So what do you think about that BQ? Yeah, I think Explosion is a, a, a very dead brand. I think bringing it back would, would not be good. But having some kind of second show, well, you know, BTI is what they're treating as their second show, but it's so recap heavy and, you know, like I don't care about what happened last week on the show. I mean, could you imagine you, you, uh, you're you going to watch the latest episode of Titans and and before before it you have to watch a half hour recap of what what the frick happened last week, you know, you sum that shit up in about thirty seconds like they do to kick off Impact. Why why if they show us at the beginning of Impact um, a good forty five second reminder of what happened last week, why are we seeing that on BTI as well? You know, like th there's right. more. If BTI was a show that wasn't just like, hey, we're throwing in a bonus show for the match for the fuck of it. If it was just like, hey, we're actually going to highlight people for three matches, people will watch it. Their average right. wrestling fan watch. Like right now, I'm like, I don't care about that show. You know, mm -hmm. like you have them. If, if I'm interested in the match, I'll check it out. But there's nothing else on there that I have any interest in. You know, right. so I, I'd rather see them uh, make that worth our time. Because even though I like the explosion name, because it wasn't, you know, in, impact centric. It was a little more original. That that the brand of that episode, that show is dead. Right. Oh, yeah. Dead, dead, dead. I remember back in the day when they used to do some fun things like little skits that EC3 would do. And that was kind of when I realized that he was somebody that was really trying to work his way up the ladder in the promotion by going out of his way to do those extra things. And I thought that was cool. But yeah, man, like you gotta evolve, man. You got to evolve. 
One thing I think Impact is really bad at, Impact and its fan base, is stop trying to run it back, man. Like, stop trying to run back all this this old stuff. Like, it was cool, man. What happened in the past was, was great, but, like, you got to move on. What's moving the business, the brand forward? What's the future? You know what I mean? Like, the time 2016 was great. 2017 was great. You had a great roster, but you know what? It's five, six years later. Okay. Like I, I watched uh, a Jade and Rosemary match from 2016. That was dope, man. It was dope, but you know what? It's six years later and neither one of them is the same wrestler they were then. And I'm not saying that in a good way or a bad way, but it's different. It's different. So don't try to get them and put them back together, hoping for that match. Because this ain't that show anymore, and those ain't the same wrestlers anymore, and that match ain't going to be that match. Like, stop trying to run it back. Impact is so bad about, listen, like I said, I think it's great that Impact embraces the TNA legacy, and 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 there should be at least one show a year where they wrap all the nostalgia. You know what I mean? Like, either do it in... Um, in Nashville or do it in Orlando each and every year, there should be some sort of, you know, anniversary homecoming type show. Um, and, and, and they should, like I said, dive head first into the TNA nostalgia, but otherwise you got to move this thing forward, man. You got to move this thing forward. You got to define what your brand is, what's going to be your place going forward, because guess what, man, the people who fell in love with TNA in 2002 are dwindling. And the people who were watching this product during its heyday from, well, like 2009 to 2013, dwindling, okay, dwindling. And so, like, if you want this product to progress and move forward, you know, into the next age of, of, of wrestling and still be, you know, a viable brand going forward, you got to figure out what's next or what you want this product to be next. Like, Impact and Impact fans, Let's 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 get over the past. Let's stop trying to run it back, and let's find what's what's next. That's like if um, 49er fan, the 49ers every season hype tried to hype up the fan base by showing highlights of Joe Montana, right? You know, or even more of a relevant, I mean, recent example, the Patriots. They go in the season and, and they start playing you clips clips of Tom Brady, you know, like a sports team wouldn't do that. They wouldn't show you clips of someone or, or you had even better example. You have someone who leaves in free agency in sports, like uh, the Warriors lose Kevin Durant a couple of years ago in free agency. And the uh, every day you get on the Warriors Twitter and they're posting highlights of Kevin Durant hitting game winners. And, and, you know, Kevin Durant did the, like, He's not on the team anymore. Right. right you know? Right. Every once exactly. in a while, you can be like, hey, this day in history, absolutely. You know, you should embrace it to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I remember a couple of years ago, Orlando Magic were getting ready for the lottery, and they said, you know, last time, you know, they were trying to take credit for drafting Victor Oladipo number two overall. Because... <laughs> You know, after he left there, he started before getting injured, was working his way up to stardom. And they didn't play him hardly. And they played him a little, but he, you know, they traded him very quickly. And they were like trying to credit, well, we, we drafted him number two overall. Like, and people were destroying them on Twitter in their comments. Like, don't, don't act like, don't take credit for his career. Right. You know, like, y'all had him, you didn't value him. Don't don't try to go back to okay. Well, guess who we used to have? Like, you know. So sports teams don't do this. You got right. it's it's a similar. Wrestling is a sport. So Matt Striker yeah, will yeah. tell you that. <laughs> All right. So we're gonna wrap this up with Brando Scandra says I wouldn't have Moose break Bobby's reign because he's 37 and now that he's reached his goal of becoming world champion he's probably on his way out after his contract is up I would have Chris Bay break Bobby's reign he's 25 and now that he has a uh, backup from Bullet Club it would be fairly easy to give him a long title reign 256 days is the longest reign all right Brando uh thank you for your comment um I would disagree with you man like I, I think that Moose I think Moose, he looks like a wrestling world champion. 
You know what I mean? And 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 it doesn't have to be. He looks like a wrestling world champion in any promotion. And I think if you're Impact, you want guys like that. You want somebody who looks dynamic. You know, people mention all all the time like the the airport test, right? Like the person who like Vince wants guys who are going to make you look when they're walking through the airport. And Moose is one of those guys. Impact doesn't have a lot of those guys. And so I don't know, man. Like I think as long as you can keep Moose dominant and and plowing through people, there's nothing unbelievable about that. And I'm pretty sure you can get 256 days out of that. So what do you think, BQ? Yeah, I agree. It's I don't feel like they're going to break the record anytime soon. But he's I, I really do think he's the one to do it. 37 is nothing in the wrestling world. There's, you know, Ricky Morton's still wrestling, you know? Yeah, Brandon, he is. <laughs> Brandon, he's not part of a, you know, major promotion. But what I'm saying, like, there's some dudes in WWE who are a lot older than uh, you would think that they are. Yeah. You know, they, they do a fairly good job of hiding uh, wrestlers' ages a lot of the time. But, but you know, the, WWE's got some dudes that are up there. Yeah. You know? Um. I, I've learned about some people's ages over the years and shocked how many, uh, actually, I, I think I was uh, listening to a stat on a podcast that a lot of wrestlers over the years who have been like fixtures in the main event scene are like in their forties. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not, it's not like people just assume, Oh, uh, you know, they're probably in their early twenties and you know, no, they, they're not. <laughs> no. You know, so <laughs> no. I don't, I don't think him being, you know, 36 or whatever, I, I, that's not even uh, a concern. And I mean, like, and the, the point is, like, he looks, he, he, he's in great, he's in the best shape of his career. You know, he's doing the best work of his career. So, I mean, and again, and if you're Impact, you don't have a lot of people on your roster that another roster is going to look at and say, I want one of those guys. I don't have yeah. a guy like that. Moose is one. So, um, so yeah, man, you got this guy, ride it out. Um, you know, for whatever reason, he seems to be, um he doesn't seem to be you know wanted by wwe uh or you know maybe aew i don't know but like but you got him he's a hot commodity you know use him you know right now he's doing great work so shout out to him um all right thank you guys all for sending in your questions we appreciate them appreciate them as always drop your comments right here below and um you know we'll be happy to get back to you uh bq did you have anything else you wanted to 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 drop on the people before we go i got nothing all right well before you go tell the people where they can find you throughout the week out here in these internet streets all right at bq speaks on twitter and at the impact lounge on twitter instagram and facebook all right. And you can find me at TW talking about on your social media of choice. You can also follow my podcast page at talking about pod. Uh, got another episode coming out for you real, real soon here. Um, thank you guys so much for tuning in. We know you guys have a lot of options for your audio content and we appreciate you taking a few minutes to kick it here with us. Uh, you know, like rate comment, subscribe. The best thing you can do is tell a friend to tell a friend. Let's bring more people into the conversation. For BQ, I'm TW. Peace.